I am Couch Cube, and this is the countdown from 25 to number one of the top local co op PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 games. This does exist as a playlist, I will link it in the description below, but I wanted to put it in a single long play video. I hope you enjoy, guys. Can we actually see some split screen? Of course, and here you go. And yes, we will see a dip in resolution, and it's not actually disturbing. When you look at a game like Dirt 5, that boasts an incredible amount of resolution and frame rates when the screen gets split because of the power of that machine and then transfer that back to 2017 and the fact that we're on a pro this game looked incredible it doesn't stutter or have any huge issues when you split the screen and there's something else they got right as well all of the progression and AI is kept in so you've got up to eight different craft hurtling around with you at the same time there's nothing worse on a racer than downtime on either screen you know if something happens the other players are lap behind us it's a kind of embarrassing sometimes but with this there's always something going on it's incredible progression comes in the form of that ship familiarity the more you race with a particular manufacturer the more you'll open up in that direction it's a great incentive and switching out and swapping the ships and the differences in their behaviors unfortunately you can't take two people online to my knowledge but that's not a huge loss the game modes in this package are massive and that's not even talking about its campaign we're on all three of the game modules is huge there's so much there that the lack of online multiplayer on a split screen level is not huge it's not like cod that if it's gone you're screwed because there's nothing else Race complete. we're looking at child of light the amazing jrpg themed adventure that came out when ubisoft used to make Couch Co-op games, good ones, Rayman Legends, Montreal. The build quality of this game is impeccable and it was one of the first PlayStation 4 games I actually got my hands on. It was free for PSN back in 2014. That was also its release date. Maybe it was a bit later when we got it on our subscription. The premise is also pretty cool, but quite tropey. You're like a kid and you've basically got some real world problems that are manifesting in, you know the deal, the sort of dream fantasy world format, think labyrinth, magic forests, enchanted kingdoms. And the whole way through this journey, you're accompanied by this little line. It's like a Tinkerbell thing going on. When you play a single player, it's on the other analog stick and it does a few things, but it opens up brilliantly with some really user friendly sort of puzzles. This is actually my mate Lewis doing this. Lewis has like finished three Dark Souls games. He's currently churning his way through Elden Ring. He can't, he can't do this for sure. Neither of us could. <laughs> Useless. The easier the stuff gets, the worse we are at it. Notice there's a little meter up in the top left here, which is not expendable. You do actually have to think about when your light's getting used, and that's what we're going to get to is how important this little dude is, how it works in conjunction on a couch co-op level. You'll get there in the end, Lewis. Slight spoiler, the game does start with you not being able to fly around like a little ginger Iron Man. You're quite ground bound, but once you open things up and the puzzles also open up in this direction, I just wanted to show you just how amazingly fluid it all feels and how the other player can sort of look ahead, open up switches, make sure the way is clear, and notice there's little plants everywhere that have the light in them. So the light gives health and staggers enemies. We're gonna look at that now, and it's incredibly well used in combat so this is like the ultimate western jrpg starter kit meaning if you get your head around the basics of this game you can basically play just about any final fantasy back catalog or even modern turn-based jrpg it's the entire system smoothed out and really put into a UI that doesn't complicate things too much and helps the younger ones get their head round exactly what's going on here. The combat kind of works in real time on a turn-based system, which I'll show you in a bit more detail in a second, and it's very tense and your little Tinkerbell helper becomes integral in the process. But let's just get back to the damned beauty of it all. Waterfalls, little secret chests, 
parallax background for 2014 and on the indie scene incidentally this is on vita as well can you believe it is well ahead of its time But let's get back to that combat and go deeper into this bar at the bottom of the screen because this is one of the coolest additions to how the combat works against that adventuring that you do outside of the arenas. What you're looking at are different enemy attacks on the below of the bar and on top of the bar the icons are your characters. And they're moving along at a speed that relates to how quick that attack is when they get to the car section. So you're jostling, waiting for a section of a turn and then implementing a move and how fast it goes through the red section is how quick that move is executed. Smaller moves are very quick and easy and you can get in front of your enemy icon and bigger moves take a longer time. But Tinkerbell can get in there and blind the enemies and cause their icon to hold back, meaning you'll get to the end first. It has been done before in a few Final Fantasy games and you do see it around sometimes, but it's kind of old school and it works so well with the co-op method of support with one person distracting and giving you health and the other person making the choices on what move and when with what character. It's perfectly divided and it causes really cool conversation between the moves and tactics and what to go for and more importantly when to go for it. Those plants also make a scene within the fight arenas. You'll see that they're empty because we've used it all up. You can go and gather to pump more health into a character that may be low. It's a great idea. It keeps the other person occupied all the time. And it's such a cool addition to what I see as a traditional turn-based RPG. <laughs> So I was talking about that starter kit idea and the way that the perk tree looks and works is beautifully simplified and I love the idea of hotkeying or just quick selecting around between your characters and not having to read lengths of description or go through pages of dialogue and if anyone else is sitting with you who's never played this sort of game before they won't be put off by a lot of these options slotting in cool gems having a really funny party including like a jester from the circus i think it's up to five in total when you get into mid to late game it's very accessible and laid back it's kind of perfect for couples and it's really cool for the younger ones maybe to play as the light character just to sort of fly around and give them the impression that they're really helping you win all they need to do is just whack r2 when they're over you or over the enemy it is that simple but if you're into your turn-based rpgs you can really do some damage with that light mechanic stack up moves open up some amazing powers magic you can just smite everybody top game this. Guns Goran Kanoni, the original, came out in 1943, <laughs> came out in 2014 and it was a cracker but there were a few things wrong with it. I remember putting it on the channel. By the way we're at number 23 of the greatest couch cult games of all time. I am Couch Coop. The second one, a bit like the Street Fighter situation where the original Street Fighter was onto something but the second one kind of personified it. There's a lot of clutching of the fingers in an upward bobbing motion in this. A lot of Italian stereotypes. It's pretty damn great. Boasting four players straight out of the gate which is awesome to see on a side scrolling platformer and this game is a bit ahead of its time with its button layout as well it has the jump on l2 and firing on r2 so you've got both thumbs to direct your weaponry around i also like the massive amount of characters that you've got to choose from and it's got one of the most violent tutorials i've ever had the pleasure to play through <laughs> Its story is that you're being hunted by the Dark Don in a sort of fantasy gangster mobster 1940s. There are zombies and Nazis pumped in. I mean, it's just so much of what you want. The one-liners and the animations on all enemies is so top-notch. The detail is ridiculous. So what's it like with two players? Well, this is the thing with it. It's actually better. A lot of platforming games can get very confusing the more players that are on screen and you spend half your time trying to work out who you are and whether you're facing the right direction. 
with this, the divide between each player is brilliant because you have very distinctive looks and of course the energy bars are different colours but it just handles it. What the camera does is completely static. Some games would attempt to zoom in if there wasn't too much going on on the edge of the screen. With GTC it's just bang straight. You notice there is no zooming around the edge, it just pans left and right and this makes you feel secure within your playing rectangle and it just boosts confidence. You end up doing double jumps, firing through the air, avoiding bullets like an expert. It falls in very quick and that's important for the second player also. You'll notice there's a weapon wheel, which is also quite an exception for a two-player game. And when four people go on this, everybody doing their weapon wheel at the same time doesn't really work. But you do have a cycle weapon on triangle. Notice these urinals getting dissipated here. I loved this best section of the game. We have two attempts at this, and the blue guys are like chargers. But back to the point, the weapon depth is absolutely colossal. Too big in my eyes for the beginning of the game, because you're swamped with all these different ideas about how to attack the enemy, dual-wielding pistols, a damned flamethrower or just the traditional baseball bat all of it falls into place perfectly this is also coupled with a roll on L1 and of course a kick on circle which pushes the enemies back. It doesn't technically hurt them, it just gives you loads of space. You are left wanting for nothing because you've got this Dead Cells roll, you've got this double jump, you've got this 360 Fury Unleashed thing going on and you've got more weapons than you would have on GTA. Get that guy! And here's the next thing. All of that would be worthless if it was too easy. And on medium difficulty, it's about perfect. I've been trying this recently. That tutorial footage is on hard. I can't do the tutorial on hard. But it's so perfectly pit. Every enemy has its individual animation dependent on how they die. And it increases the difficulty at such a pitch that you're sucked in. Before you know it, you are angry at the game for pushing you back and swamping you and dying to get back into it. Just to show it that you have worked things out and you're going to murder everything everybody on screen. This is our second attempt at the urinal scene and this time we're not mucking about. Now it may have happened to you already but you might just be sniggering out loud at a lot of the things that happen A to the enemies, B to yourself and C to the environment. It's got so much to watch when I put the replay on, watching the Molotov cocktail guys and the dudes when they're in their idle animations checking their guns or eating a bit of pizza. <laughs> it's so great to watch this game and I think that's one of the joys is that you will be laughing out loud at a lot of the stuff that goes on and shouting at each other because you won't know what direction the next enemies are going to come from. Some Someone might be on fire, everything likes to explode brilliantly and chain react, you'll get a lot of environmental traps that involve things falling on pianos, falling on people's heads. It does go full Roger Rabbit quite a lot of the time. We suffered one freeze and you just saw it then. This is all PlayStation 5 footage, no official boost for the game. It runs fantastically on base level PlayStation 4s and even had a bit of pro enhancement on frame rate, I seem to remember. This is definitely a PEG 60, it's smooth AF, but performance isn't an issue sometimes on new environments or even if you pick up a new piece of equipment, it does that whole handshake, I'm having a stroke thing, but it's all over within a nanosecond. Although it does advertise the four player aspect, three people are just about bearable. If all three of you know what you're doing and you can keep an eye on each other, then it's a fantastic fun. Two people with someone who's less experienced than you have to sort of manage and shout at, then it is doable. But of course, if you both know what's going on and the penny has dropped and you're into that double jump and avoiding, the game just starts smashing past you and you see some incredible things. The bosses, for me, in early game are a little bit lackluster. I want to see maybe a massive monster mobster mech or something called I haven't finished it so I'm gonna keep going and see what some of those end game levels are like so far everything is absolutely spectacular including this theater and the cops showing up as well which happens in mid game so you've also got the police to contend with
the original is really good and I looked on store a couple of weeks ago and it was around like four quid five dollars something like that so if you've got this and you kind of exhausted it and you want to just see where it all came from then get it I totally recommend it it's just that you'll feel a, a bit locked on that gun firing direction everything else is completely on par with this including having four players and loads of enemies to kill and really interesting and funny environments so not a bad idea if you feel that you want more GGC which is totally understandable I've also completely forgot to talk about, and it's in the title, it's gore and it's unapologetic amount of blood that's in it. I think that some games, when they indulge in this direction, can work and it's quite refreshing to see, you know, adult content in a couch co-op game. This is not dumbed down for children by any stretch and it is quite <laughs> horrific. Some of it and the splatters are huge. In the original you blow up these chefs which actually put the blood all over the screen. It's not as gory as the first one so there's another incentive to go and dig that one up is that you'll see more gore. We're going with Darksiders Genesis. As you know, I have a particular love for a decent ALPG, even more love for a couch co-op one, and the Darksiders series doesn't really lean on this game format. It's more of a third-person hack and slash. They've been really great and strong games, to be fair, but it was so cool to see this new direction. You know how hard it is to sneak this stuff past, Bulgram? I wanted to show some of this starter hub because it's got quite a lot of care and love put into it. It's pretty cool how you get looked after really well with its metagame mechanics. It doesn't stand too far out of the ARPG upgrade box, but it does do something extremely interesting when it comes to couch co-op. Now, you're all familiar with Diablo 3 or Children of Mortar. Anything that is of this angle normally adheres to a particular rule with regards to its playstyle, meaning you're both kind of locked on the same screen and you can run each other off and someone falls down a gap and it just can be a bit of a nightmare. Not as much of a nightmare as these goddamn loot planks you have to go on. I'm also showing you a bit of the cool single player because you control both characters, not simultaneously, you switch them in and out. So it's like having two loadouts to worry about. It's cool, it allows you to adjust to situations, but it's not as cool as having them both on screen at the same time, and that is the online that would cater for that if you don't have a couch co-op partner. We must reach some out soon. One minute in, he's just got to the couch co-op. That's not bad for me, I think. Now, let's look at these two characters because one of them is blatantly massively different. War, or the red melee guy, is just so much more powerful with close quarters moves. He's got an upgrade tree that revolves around error effect attacks that really center around him as a character. Then, of course, on the left, you've got range and abilities, agility to jump around, be a bit sneaky, almost an assassin type get in, get out type set of moves so it's so great choosing which one to play as and I actually favor them both the range works incredibly well and of course you feel impactful as the melee close quarters guy because of these really good animations on a lot of the specials Because these screens are independently split, it gives the game a lot more room to put in traversal puzzles or even just an environment that allows you to both independently explore. That is something you just do not see in a lot of couch co-op ARPGs because it's just too difficult a thing to manage. But with this, you are not tethered and it's strange to get used to, but you can just wander off get around the back of the enemy and it also boosts communication because sometimes you won't see your couch co partner on screen at all you're like where the hell are you I'm, I'm dying there is no escape. one of the more cooler mechanics of modern games especially with action role-playing games is that when you increase the power of your character or put things into your skill tree or a particular move and that move physically changing on screen to something that looks better, increases the damage, is more flashy. It's such an incentive for me to get to that move or start exploring with different hockeys and moves in conjunction with each other. The next layer on that is the person you're playing with may have the same system so you can start interlocking with what you put into that skill tree. And we'll get to that in a second because they've laid on an even more detailed mechanic involving a core system, which means that you can almost open up 
the skills of the enemies that you're killing if you want to grind enough. And this is just brilliant because I want to take my character into loads of different directions, but more importantly, I want to see the fruition of those directions within the gameplay itself. Big, massive moves, cool little animated things coming off everything I've pumped into the development of that character. Here's the other thing, this isn't billed as an action RPG, this is billed as a top-down hack and slash, which is a great angle on the advertising front because it does want to be the latter. And of course it is trying to draw from its Darksiders heritage with the non-player characters and that hub is all quite familiar stuff if you've played the series. So it's cool that they want to just keep billing it as a hack and slash even though it's blatantly a Diablo clone. And it's a really good Diablo clone because it's splitting the screen, putting cool puzzles in, and giving you some like finisher moves, and here's the other crux, a parry or block. So it's so great to be able to time an attack, see something coming in, hit a button, and get a reward from being sharp enough to deflect that attack. With the Diablo, you're just looking at a glass bowl in the corner to see with the red runs out to fill it up again. It's not got that tension. This has got a Children of Mortar level of tension because death is just around the corner if you're not paying attention. It also has an open exploration version of each level map with rewards, small side quests, separate side bosses, even quests within quests in an area that you might have discovered within a map. It wants to promote you completely 100%ing all of the icons on that map screen, which involves sometimes backtracking or even having to nip back to get a particular core that you might have missed. I do and don't like that idea. They are rinsing each level for all it's worth, but you start to get to know the area itself and it does add scaling. And of course, if you've completed a playthrough and you want to go through on hard, everything is in the same place. It's not like that roguelike idea where it's mixing and rolling out different layouts. You can just get your head around what needs to be done, but of course, everything is hot as damn nails but I like that in an ARPG. You start to glaze over Pillars of Eternity if things can get a bit mundane and you're not gonna be killed round the corner by something massive and OP. It's, the fear is good. This is the core skill tree and it's very interesting because some of these core stones or gems can have a few pumped into them that increases how far you can develop it further down that particular arm and some it's one in one out you can't have big gold cores all in the same slots you're constantly thinking about how to utilize what you've got to its maximum and give you some big damage or reverse that and just make sure that you're a bit more tanky because there's a larger boss coming up this whole thing is separate to the other character playing with you and the differences in move sets and actual stuff that you open that implements within battle itself is amazing it's really cool when you get a new move open or purchased this changes so much with the meta gameplay Incidentally, I should mention this is running on a PlayStation 5. Do I see any noticeable jumps in performance from the Pro to this version? No. Has there been any official 5 update or patch? No. Was it needed? Not really. We didn't see any major performance issues on the PlayStation 4 Pro. Hand on heart, I have not played this on base system and I could imagine that it would barely stay at 30 frames because this game gets damned busy. Some of the boss fights are massive set pieces. You saw that one earlier, they're larger than that and maybe on multiple tiers and levels so that you won't be in the same place fighting it. It's incredible how it keeps the performance up and I do love its look and sound. It's got this operatic, almost ghost in the shell songs wailing away in the background that only increase the intensity of all the fights. And I love every little animation on the finisher moves, which it does have a bit of a nightmare with. It likes to use a depth of field system that it can fall foul of sometimes with either screen having a bit of a blurred effect. You also become quite fond of your horse and traversing through the levels nice and quickly in tandem with each other 
on the back of an undead zombified stallion kind of doesn't get boring you can also attack from it as well and you never know what you're going to find around the corner especially at the start of a new map because you've got this huge open space that you can go really any direction in do the bosses at your own pace find out what new creature cores are going to be hidden around if you have a playthrough and you know what the game wants once you get to a puzzle it's totally bearable but you will be stuck for a long time or having to deal with an awkward jump at an angle that's not quite clear to you they've bitten off a little bit too much than they can chew on that front but it just gives the game a bit of added spice and variety to be fair and they're not too taxing and it's nice to have a cool r2 bionic commando style winch that gets you over big gaps things get quite dramatic and having that small bit of downtime between the combat encounters totally gives it the spice that you really crave when it comes to playing like a couple of hours of any ARPG. I've just had someone mention that Inquisitor is an alright game but after an hour it gets boring and they have a point because you're not dealing with anything other than pointing your gun at a load of enemies coming down a corridor. With this it's a total adventure with puzzles, loot, big bosses, a weird ass story, amazing different set pieces to fight everything in and some graphics that are totally holding up. This game still looks really pretty and I hope there would be a 5 boost on it. Maybe give it like a 4k peg 60 even with the split. That's not a big ask THQ Nordic. Was that your best? So we've got Broforce. It probably came out when I was 21. Did it come out in the 80s, did it? Actually, funny you should say that, because Broforce is all about the 80s. Four-player, 80s platform shooter. The emphasis is on the platforming just as much as the shooting. You've also got a grab mechanic. One thing needs to be explained here. This is the hardest game, hardest indie game I own by a long... It's the hardest couch card game I own as well by a hell of a long stretch. Get this one. I've never got past the first stage, though. You can't tell them that. Okay, and I've got nothing to hide here because it was a revolution for me. I got this game free when I first got my base level machine when the PlayStation 4 came out originally. This was given to us on the store and I was still getting used to the PSN store and holy shit was it a lot better back then, five, maybe six years ago. But this was on there. I was like, whatever, I'll just have a quick look. Played it on the one player, man. And I was, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I had to keep pausing it and just saying... I'm, you know, pinch me somebody because it was exactly what I was looking for. I hadn't even gone to get in a mate round and enjoying all this blood and gore. I suppose I should quickly just cover its claim to fame. It's about saving people on a course that opens up new 80s iconic bros like Will Smith, <laughs> but seriously, Rambo's in here, Dirty Harry's in here, Chuck Norris is in here, there's a chicken throwing, Stetson wearing, nutcase. Little challenge, which film star is twice featured as a bro? Is not that many. You've got Robocop in here as well, and you've got some amazing bosses. Difficult, frustrating, nail-bitingly tough bosses and levels. The insta-kills everywhere. One bullet, there's one bullet there. Oh I mean, I've played a lot of video games. Nothing's prepared me for a dog to throw itself off a platform and die. Then one of the other dogs noticing the corpse and going in and chowing down. That, okay, that's not even us getting involved in the vice. Just doing it on its own. That's some crazy ass stuff. Yeah, Stallone. Sylvester Stallone's the Duke Blue because he is both Dread, right, and Rambo. I'm assuming there's no more um, because Bruce Willis is only diehard Bruce Willis. There isn't any, and Chuck is just that one turkey throwing thing. Why am I giving one of the most lax deep dives possible? Well, I've reviewed this game about 16 times. It will go at the top of every four player list I make. It will go in the top three of every size scrolling platform and indie game I make. And it will go on top of just about most couch co-op list it's a staple it really is spectacular and the chain reaction effects with the pixels blowing up and barrels whizzing around and the blood flying over everyone's head it doesn't get any better than this when it comes to a gory side scrolling platforming game and i have said that numerous times <sighs> I 
I suppose it's one thing having a one-shot bullet policy on death or even full damage being ridiculous. What I mean is all of the levels don't really have a ground floor, so any gap is a potential instant kill. It's the boulders that you get to mid-game where if you go anywhere near below one, fire at one above your mate's head, you've just, again, insta-kill because gravity is extremely harsh in this. It really reminds me of Boulder Dash. I know a lot of you may not remember that game, but it was like an excavation game with fixed soil. It's kind of looking in that direction sometimes, but the amount of tactics you have to use when you're burrowing through that earth. You also might be thinking this should be a hell of a lot higher than 21, and in theory it should, but when we get down to that 15 and top 10, I want them to be as modern and sort of cool and new as possible. This is nostalgia now. You're looking at an older game here. It came out in 2014, that magic year we had so much good content from Sony that went up straight onto our systems as couch cop games out of the gate. Some of my audience is newer and younger and may have only just got a system in the last couple of years and not even realised that there's a gem lying back there in 2014 in the form of Broforce. When it talks about four player and it has been tested numerous times and reviewed on the channel as a four player, you can't tell what the hell's going on. Yeah, I mean, you saw a freeze just then with two people. It, it, people that just die and then think they're still alive because you're moving around and they haven't clocked the fact that they were knocked off the screen 10 minutes ago. Nothing stops, you see. And so three people, I think, is three experienced people, two noob and a vet, probably the way forward. <laughs> At the time, Devolver didn't have that big a name on console games as a publisher. They were quite large on PC and they had, of course, Hotline Miami come out. But I would have paid a lot more attention to this publisher if I'd have known how good their games are going to be in the next five to ten years of them putting them together. Brilliant quality. This one is no exception. And it kind of set the bar for me. Everything else after it was never near Broforce and its violence, its noise, its beautiful 80s aesthetic and that 8-bit amazing destruction mechanics on everything within the level. That is just so joyous and refreshing as well. You get a lot of platformers that have got just locked like trying, nothing really moves. This is just complete pandemonium. If you own the game, I want you to confess in the comments exactly what level you've got to. I might ask for screenshots, but I don't think it's fair that it's just me, a big couch co big couch co YouTuber, a couch co YouTuber. Can't get past level one. It's not the fact that the people I play with are inept. And when I say level one, I mean biome one, all right? I mean that jungle thing. I haven't got to all that Geiger stuff, and that hurts. The Fury at least did that, to go and put a Geiger level right down the back end. Of course, you need a carrot to take you through, and a, nothing's better than an 8-bit Geiger carrot, but bloody hell, I don't know. I might be a 50-year-old by the time I finish this game. But you're going to finish it this week, Kip. Stop with the age jokes, mate. Because of its one-shot, one-kill policy, you kind of get a little bit stagnated sometimes as well. With Because you can't shoot down, you can only go across and you have to cause sort of booby traps and avalanches to try and get enemies below you safely sometimes. The game might implement a flying canister or some explosives, but if you've run out of grenades, you've really got to start taking loads of risks. And that's fun. You come out afterwards working out who's still alive, and things happen so quickly that it's past reaction speed. It's just blind luck that you may make it through these games sometimes. It's also not for grandma or a kid's game, which again, I find refreshing, especially with indie. It's cool to really indulge in some of that darker visual stuff and have those nods to all of those classic 80s action heroes. That just gives it a deeper nostalgia with me and all of those nods and the differences in their firing patterns. Robocop Special is actually the laser that goes and pinpoints things that you're gonna fire at, a la the drug scene in the movie. What a hell of a tribute and what a great idea to put all of this variety on the different characters. The 2014, 2016 and 2017 may have been the golden years for Couch Co-op on the PlayStation 4. My story starts with this one a little bit like the Broforce scenario, where I'm totally wet behind the ears with what the PlayStation 4 has to offer. I've got my PlayStation Network account, and ping this comes in as a free game. Never heard of it, never seen it. I didn't even notice that it was two-player co-op. And let me say this, few games on this top 25 
completely cater for four people very few some of them advertise it but don't pull it off because it's just too much going on this is perfectly tailored for four people and it's passive what i mean is it's not about reaction speed it was the first couch co-op game i'd come across that allowed me to pull in non-gamers members of the fairer sex don't say that you get cancelled accessibility is the answer i'm looking for it's the perfect couples game and i'll go into explaining why it hit the nail on the head so well and i'll moan about why we haven't had anything as strong as this since Let me explain its mechanic, if I can, and it's a strange one. You're basically controlling a spaceship which has got an engine on it, which revolves 360 degrees around the sphere. The engine's controlled from the central nodule, and all guns and the shield, which is that funny wavy line, are also controlled from central consoles. But they're all positioned differently, and one player can only man one console at a time. You can't have all guns blazing, unless you've got four people and that's the attraction. Having four little men running around in this little sphere and operating everything with clean proficiency is how this game's supposed to be played. And the communication, it is almost like old school Star Trek where you're like, someone needs to get onto the helm because all four of you are manning the guns and no one's actually flying the ship which is drifting <laughs> into oblivious space. Now it's one thing being hooked by having a brilliant four player setup. It's another thing being sucked in by the amazing power-ups and the weapon system you can unlock cool new ships with more terminals better guns it's deep as hell all of this recent footage is just me on my playstation 5 i did it for two reasons i've covered the game on a multiplayer level on the channel before but i've never seen how far i can get on my own and what happens is you get a helper and a hot wheel it's very snappy sending the guy to another gun or dealing with a situation where he's got to go to numerous terminals is brilliant and the game slows down during that period. I do want to point out how the upgrade system works. There are little presents that drift in and you've got to proactively go and open that damn present right in the middle of a gunfight and slot it into whatever you want to power up and that's a really cool idea. You have a build system where you could just spend all your upgrades on the external guns or you'd have a big fat shield. You can actually put it into the jet engine itself giving you better propulsion. Propulsion's key because it gets you in and out of trouble and your mates can't shoot something if you're not facing it. So there's the whole disagreement about turning the damn thing the right way and not hitting the sides or any other furniture because the damage is huge. The sheer noise of it will get to you. I think they should adjust the whininess of the things that you rescue. And they are basically tickers for how much you've got to do in the open world map, which is another awesome idea. Down in the bottom left, you've got where all your objectives are. You've got smoke covering the areas you've not been to. And back to that propulsion problem, there are orbits around certain planets, which means you can just step off the engine console and get involved with the guns and shields and everybody else. I like to allocate somebody to do the drive in full stop. And that can get a little bit boring for that individual, but it's a very responsible task. You'd think that would be enough. Big open world, loads of monsters and aliens flying around and upgrades, but the game gives you so much more. Each mission can be very complicated, making you venture into a really tricky tight space to go and rescue one of those whiny little things. And I got the last whiny little thing and it triggered a massive explosion, right? Which was building up from the center of the map and I had to get to the exit point. It was fantastic. The panic was there. We didn't shoot anything. We just had to hair it to the exit. It was a great piece of urgency put in unexpectedly at the end of what we thought was a standard mission. <laughs> It reminds me a little bit of Galaxy. It does not have enough variety on bigger enemy types. They do come in later levels and there is certain boss fights which utilize this amazing orbital mechanic, but it's just not that enough of a variety at the start and I would like to see more craziness coming your way, maybe stuff that latches onto the ship itself or even fires back more. You can shoot at the bullets, so if you're a good enough gunner, you don't even need that shield to be brought round. So the recommended amount of people to play this with 
is two, three, and four. Would I recommend having a go at it on your own? Yeah, because you get to feel around with exactly what's going on, and you'd be quite surprised how far you can get with this game, just allocating that little dude to various tasks. But it really shows how much importance and really the bedrock of the message of this game is that you need two people to enjoy it and it will cater for up to four. Few games do that. You've got to look at It Takes Two and maybe A Way Out, which are games that you cannot progress with without another human being. With this, you can actually get stuff done. And I had a moral decision about where to put this upgrade nodule and I put it into the yellow one-shot gun and I'm like, all right, Raccoon, you get do the honors. Look at it, it's a blade. I also want to point out that there's a bit of a spoiler this. There is a fifth thing that you've got to look after and it's your like hyperdrive, which turns out to be the most vulnerable, largest external nodule you could put on that craft. So you've now got to make sure that that's not getting fired at. That's just like the propulsion duct that you'd have on the normal engine, but it just adds this another layer of panic and it pokes out of that force field as well and it puts a wave system at the end of your third level, I think it is. This is the brick wall for me on my own. That poor little AI raccoon could only handle so much of me shouting at him. This is, I think, where it comes in to its own. The whole time this is happening, I'm like, I need my mates here. If only I had someone else here. The game wants you to bring in help. It needs it, and it's an integral part of getting to these harder levels, which I think is a brilliant thing. It's good to have some content on your own, but when you really want to get good at this, you've got to pull someone else in, and that's a selling point, I think, when it comes to a couch co-op game. I have chosen Next Makama because it's got a five boost. And of course it ran extremely well on base level systems, including the Pro, it had Pro enhancements I remember. But we've got 60 frames per second and 4K apparently. This is all PlayStation 5 footage, but none of it captured at 4K. It uploaded at 1080. Could have been my fault. I'm not too sure what the exact specs are. I will stop moaning and start focusing on this gorgeous game. Didn't even notice there was a retro mode in the options that allows you to put it on a cool low res TV and you can go black and white like 7th Samurai style. I've also not downloaded my cloud save, so none of my PlayStation 4 progression is on my 5th. It's deliberate. I want to go from the beginning. want to see what's changed. If that boost is really an eye-opener and it kind of is I mean it was a smooth game anyway but I want to point out that in the profile on options which I didn't spot it's got loads of unlockables on all of the cosmetics and even the bullet color didn't even see that first playthrough This is easily one of the best arcade twin stick local co-op games available on the systems, PlayStation 4 and 5. I've gone through a lot of deliberation over that and it's been in a huge amount of lists and gone up against some of the biggest twin stick shooters on the market. Over the last six years the game has been scrutinized by me a great deal because it's from Outsmart and you may have recognized some of the games in that intro. They have a very interesting history and they came out with a game called Matterfall and put the announcement down that they were closing as an independent studio. Little did we know that Sony was going to scoop them up and they were going to roll out a huge AAA PlayStation 5 exclusive under the name of Returnal. And you can see bits of Returnal all over this game and a lot of Housemarque's previous titles. It's very interesting to see the roots of an incredible PlayStation 5 exclusive. Next Makama loves its neons, it loves its action, and its cubist dissipation, I've coined that terminology, that's used in Rezogun quite a lot, and you even see it in some of the dissipation mechanics on the furniture within Returnal. The game has a lot more structure than it makes out. It's got an actual campaign, arcade mode has got placed bosses, the same levels, but these amazing secrets that are just everywhere. And of course it's got a random drop on your power-ups and perks. This changes a lot because you'll get something really good really early or it will just make you wait for ages and you'll end up building something else up like your dash or your speed. There are so many power-ups, risk of rain level, but they're not documented. They're just scattered, meaning your playthroughs are very different every time. You'll always run into something that's going to mix it up and change a lot of the dynamics of what your character is capable of and what sort of support you can offer. 
The levels all pan out as to rescue the humans. If you played Resogun, you know the deal. You've got a timed situation where the enemies are going after these green dudes and you've just got to get to them before they do or protect them. Sometimes there's so much going on that it all just ripples past in a matter of seconds. You may have destroyed a key group of enemies that are signified by this line sometimes that they will have a secret human in them. Very rarely can you 100% and get all of the secret humans. It's crazy good and you're always looking and guessing to work out what you haven't shot at or moved over before. One massive boost on the five is the restart and reload times. They're almost instant. It's absolutely perfect. Like Cuphead quick, you'll be straight back in and that really takes the edge off doing a level for the 15th time. If those systems are sticky and annoying, you just can't be bothered with this. It knows you've got to get straight back in and start fighting those crazy ass bio insectoid robotic awesome enemies you don't get to look at anything in detail when you play on this game you physically can't you've got too much going on on the replays looking at the different hierarchies and shapes of all these cool little spider mini boss enemies and the turrets the way they transform or walk it's top-notch stuff it's one of the best looking indie games and i'm saying that against returnal which is from them as well and also has this absolutely stellar look and performance What I also like about the co-op setup is that you share the lives and if someone uses them all up and dies the other person has to finish that level to bring them back in and this creates an amazing bit of urgency and of course you can keep going with one person doing a level whilst the other person watches gets brought back in and you switch around and manage to just claw your way through a load of difficult levels. Its boss fights are really also showstoppers, huge arena based massive creatures and robots that you have to fight in a particular tiered system and you'll see crazy stuff when you get to the end of something that you thought had transformed into its final form it doesn't let up with impressing you and it's got a level choice system so if you're not too into these rock hard twin sticks you can still have a look around this game and i'm actually trying to think back to whether the playstation network offered it for free i'm pretty sure they would have done secret human saved it's also got a very workable online system and as a single player game I totally love it. It's one of Housemark's greats. You've got Matterfall, you've got Detonation, obviously you've got Resogun and of course even Stardust and the older games. This one is sitting proudly in the top echelons of all of that. It even goes hell for leather against Returnal as far as I'm concerned because we still have excellent visuals and we've got that couch co-op. There is one other housemark back catalogue indie game that is yet to come up on this list and you probably all know what it is and I'm going to deliberate exactly how far to the front I put that game. If you've never laid eyes on this game before my advice is to just go and grab it. Not available physical to my knowledge. Only exclusive to the hill and only two player local co-op but all of that is worth it. It's a stellar piece of indie gaming to be put on that system. And I'm just a little bit miffed that we won't see anything like this from housemark again because they're now charging forward with bigger triple-a titles you never know they might announce a triple-a alienation too Whoa! we are looking at the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles this is not number 18 it's made by the people that made number 18 which is interesting because I can get a bit of a vibe from them with the new Mutant Ninja Turtles game it is of course Mercenary Kings and if you've been keeping up with the list you'll know that Next Makama was number 19. How the hell are you going to pitch that this is better than Next Makama? Well it's very different and it's got a hell of a lot of longevity. Next Makama is good for a playthrough. Of course harder playthroughs are obviously worth a look. I always crave depth with my split screen games especially with my side scrolling run and gunners and that's what this is. It's got a Barnet Commando vibe and it's got some beautiful looks i really love the art everybody's got their animations this is one of the coolest sort of hub slash npc areas in a side scrolling platformer and this is the depth that we're talking about here the game is actually a crafter and gatherer can you believe 
time reload is straight out of alienation and that brings me on to the differences in weaponry and the incentive to bolt things onto your gun template literally magazine stock barrel sight you have elements you can reduce that reload speed and that yellow bar either side of the green giving you more efficiency the game wants to panic you which it does a pretty good job of doing you can also fire up in the air but not down below and not diagonally so it's not a locked parallel firing arc I'm now looking at two player split screen mode now this brings me on to my second selling point which initially jarred me and it's that map screen that's permanently placed in those bottom two windows if you remember a game called cave story or anything else that exists within a semi-open world map that has objectives in it that you have to get to there may be stages there may be keys locked doors on this one we had to use some c4 to get through a barricade to get to a boss's very strictly timed and it gives so much more an angle to what would normally be a run and gun side scrolling platform shooter. Neon Chrome, this game is not. Now let's look at the huge selling point, which would have been obvious to anybody seeing those bottom two panes being occupied by a map screen, and it's yes, it is really geared up to have four people enjoy this game, and there is no tethering, completely autonomous, it even pushes the idea of people going off to do their own thing, if you don't have a first aid pack, you can't get a revive and you'll spawn back at the hut at the start of the level, thus splitting you up from everybody else. Trouble is, the map screen's got to be accessed on a communal level, which takes, again, some getting used to. Back to the depth thing, I don't want to ignore the character selection, because some characters come with equipment as standard, which really helps, almost gives them a loadout, and that brings me on to the revive or the defib. It's really cool to play the robot or have the soldier in, because different people come with different perks as standard, but everything else can be bought. Everybody has their own money, and when you get back to the hub, it's a little bit borderlandsy, where you're running around, upgrading everything spending money on a different barrel for your new gun or buying some extra health packs or rations the depth is so cool and it really comes into play when four people start thinking about how to take on an objective This game is not going to be for everybody, and if it wasn't for the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game shining so well, I wouldn't have taken the time to step back and have a look at this under a fresh light for 2022. And the cool news is, it still really holds up. I very much enjoy it on a single player level. I haven't got to worry about everybody else, I get to see what Endgame's all about, and really start bolting on some crazy stuff to my gun. This is available on Switch, runs just as well as it does on the 4 or 5, and this latter footage you're looking at now is PlayStation 5 footage. No huge boost, the game never dipped really. With an art style like this, you don't have to worry about that sort of stuff. Bravo Zulu! Would you get more out of this game than something like Cuphead? The answer to that is kind of yes. Cuphead will have some massive brick walls in it, or although it's a run and gunner it is very surface level with a lot of its power-ups and a lot of its character development and the world's even being quite narrow and railsy it's kind of about boss fights not about exploring a cool open map and getting to different secret caverns and finding out what a question mark symbol means at the back of a cave that exploration idea and the upgrade hub idea really gives this game much needed strength Also, having it in number 18 in this list brings more awareness to it. I think a lot of people really enjoyed that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, and they might want more from the developer. And they also might want more from a side-scrolling platform run and gunner. This was quite individual when it comes to its game model, and not really that much has been put out in the direction after it. Stuff like the music, this retro art style, and this exploration vibe is a really a heart back to a lot of games in maybe the early 2000, 2005. So I love this genre. I want to see more of it. So fingers crossed we do get more. Contra clones are great, but we always crave a little bit more longevity in what we can achieve with our character development or what we're gonna to get to see with maybe secret or mini bosses or maybe areas of that world or map that are completely unusual. This has got quite a lot of indigenous life in it. It's crazy with picking up meat 
and killing various bits of wildlife. It's quite brutal, uh, the way that it pushes its gathering techniques, but it's cool and you get to see the results when you get back to the hub and start making a brand new gun or giving yourself a riot shield. Some great equipment is available very early on in the game. The brilliant animations on all of the deaths and gore don't really need to be mentioned. It comes with the territory, I think, with a game like this. They totally delivered on that front. I am Couch Coop and this is number 17. The sun is shining. We got one of the best four player, three player, two player Couch Court races on the market. Came out in 1997. This game is absolutely stunning, has been on the channel for years and I thought it was a really good time to revisit it. It's a funny little game. It's got the most user-generated content I've ever seen on an indie title. And when I say indie, I mean indie studio, Ubisoft publisher. This is back in the sweet spot, the golden age, when Ubisoft used to make damn good couch co-op games, Child of Light, Rayman Legends, I don't need to go on, this is one of them. Clues in the name with this one, Wealth of Tracks, that's what it's selling on. One of the weaker sides of this is that the couch co-op mode doesn't boast much AI integration. It's all about how many people you can kind of bring on board. That's why it's good news that it's four player, but you are never bored with the amount of user generated tracks. It's like three and a half thousand official user challenges, but everything is off the hook with what they're gonna do with where that track's gonna go. Loop the loops, jumps that will blow your mind, and just a sensation of speed that still holds up today, I feel. That puts me on to why I fired this game up after all this time and put it this high on the list. I wanna check for any updates, current gen or previous gen systems performing better, you know the deal. We are looking at PlayStation 5 footage. I do not see any major improvements from the PlayStation 4 Pro. We did see dips when this gets put onto four player, I'll show you, but it wasn't as smooth as I was expecting it to be. I think it's above 30 and it's running at 1080. Why the hell they don't put a lovely PlayStation 5 next gen update in and just give everybody a reason to fire this up again? Because that's the only thing that holds it back a bit is that you've just got to look at Dirt 5 and realize how much the industry's moved on since this game came out and where the F is the sequel. <laughs> It's so strange because this is a game that I kind of walked away from about three, four years ago. I mean, it's a racer, but yeah, I'm not gonna sink thousands of hours into it. And you know those like strange, generic, like normie Facebook gaming posts or groups that you get? And map of this will come up. It will be someone who's done an impossible jump after like five years, but it's so popular still. This is really popular over on PC still. I think because of those user challenges, giving you that content so much longevity, but it's just no excuse for coming out with the fantastic arcade racer on a local cop level and just never giving us anything else ever since. Uh, with some innovative tracks that could just give you all this entertainment. Now this four player footage is super interesting. This is from 2017 when my channel had first started and this is from a base level PlayStation 4 system and you can see how low, I think we're dealing with 720 here. It takes a huge dip on that four screen split, but what it doesn't do is have any performance issues with people suffering lag or just input issues, nothing. It's just this low resolution and 30 frames per second is the only thing that will affect you. Back to my previous point, when you look at a game like Crash Bandicoot on four screens, or even, again, Dirt 5, they're a world apart, a world apart now. This game also comes with some very interesting modes, allowing like a hot seat driver mode where two people control one car and you can also take two people online and take two people online in that hot seat mode up against 16 other players. So you're not gonna get bored with using those different race types, but you might get a bit miffed that there's not 21 AI cars herring down the road with you. You've only got to look at Wipeout to realize how important that can be, but if there's four of you and you want to just have a really tight, quick race around a very small, intimate track and there's none of that smashing in because everything's on a ghost car, so if you bugger up, it's your own fault, the intensity of that kind of hasn't been equaled since this game came out, hence the reason we're whacking it in at number 17.
Other games in the four-player racer canon on the PlayStation 4 and 5 include things like Horizon Turbo Chase and Hotshot Racers, two of which are pretty new and I might pick one of them out for the final 10. The final 10 is going to be very tense for me because I purposely don't want to repeat a lot of the material I've put in, let's say my zombie lists or let's say my co-op campaigns list. So I'm going to try for these off-center slightly older but also slightly unknown gems so bear with me on it this is great footage of the quick restart system on circle you can just go bang from the start line and restart the race like in an instant and it is perfect for single player on two player you can do triangle which is just resetting the car on the track which happens in a nanosecond and sometimes can be a hell of a lot easier than tackling these corners but things just really go crazy there's no other game that gives you this sort of madness when it comes to the track design and just sheer unpredictable outcome when it comes to racing around these absolutely awesome tracks Some of you, like me, may have got it free and it's probably sitting there on your library and it hasn't been touched in half a decade. I strongly suggest digging it out and trying to do all of those cool challenges on the single player mode and getting a mate in or a partner over to just smash through some of these amazing challenges. Go online, try the hot seat mode and just see that this game is still around, still popular, servers are still up, people are still obsessed with it so it's doing something right. The 1080 and no 60 frames per second, it falls away after a while, but it is a bit of a shock to the old eyeballs when you first fire this up or when things start getting fast and you might suffer from nausea. I was getting a bit old man sick, I think, on some of these first person views. I was like, woof, hyperlight drifter. Declaration here did not realize it was couch co-op for the first like year and a bit of owning it Did they pull a nobody saves the world and add it as an update? I don't know I didn't get flagged of that But it's by the by the game is incredible as a single player and I very much appreciate the opportunity to go through it on my own I also appreciate these visuals giving us striking 16-bit fantastic art mixed with some very smooth well-drawn animation when this came out when we all clapped eyes on it first off it was like a shot to the heart of any retro gamer it just reeked of indie quality a very quick touch on performance running this on the playstation 5 i think we're seeing a peg 60 obviously 1080 but it's nice to have a game like this smooth as butter Its introduction and different vistas at the start are perfectly placed, giving you this really intriguing, strange, dark backstory. And just as a nod to Salt and Sanctuary, just one button please to add another player and it's fantastic to see them appear. And for me, it was a complete showstopper seeing that other character. I was like, oh my God, things just got twice as good. Let's touch on the gameplay model very quickly because it's quite important for the second person that comes in. This is very much an action role playing game with a hub that kind of reminds me of some early Zelda title. You visit, you upgrade there, you get your quest there and you venture further from there in different directions on a map to get bosses or various mini bosses and side quests. It's important on an upgrade level because your powers that you start with are minuscule and that happens to the person that joins you but that's cool because they do need a profile and it will save on there and you can just start visiting the hub and making sure you're upgrading simultaneously but if they come in mid game or mid level they're kind of a little bit naked with a lot of their upgrades. If you've played Unsighted, you'll know exactly what you're looking at here. The control mechanism is almost identical with a dodge button that you can technically spam. There's no stamina and some range on the other triggers, but of course a nice big thwacking melee on the face buttons and all of this can be meddled around with and upgraded. It nails the feeling of adventure so perfectly. It reminds me a little bit of that introduction to Breath of the Wild, where there's ruinous environments everywhere. There's been some cataclysmic event and there's old sort of relic robots lying around everywhere. And you're sort of piecing together what on earth happened. The game also puts you underground a lot in corridors and pushes you towards a hell of a lot of puzzles. Too many for my liking.
The plot or objectives kind of revolve around these shards that open up different areas of the map, show you where different bosses are and sort of go to collate in the middle village. And you've got a whole bunch of them to get. And what I like is that you can go in any direction from the village. A lot of people head straight right. It's a little bit like Dark Souls when each direction could spell certain death because you can venture into an area that you're blatantly not powerful enough to deal with. It's got a distinct lack of handholding and text on screen. This is fantastic. Parian promoted this very well and it's just pictures, various little nudges to the directions that you need to go in. And some people may find this a bit difficult. There is no major quest line. All you've got to do is get rid of these bosses and get everything sorted out in the village and how you do that and at what pace and when is your call. And it's a very, very good idea because they've catered for it so well by giving you this beautiful immersive world full of temples and ruins and relics and really interesting characters that have got a lot to tell you about what's happened previously. is also very easy to come unstuck in combat. Lose where you are, think you're the other player, or just drop off the edge of the map, which isn't too punishing, but it will clip a bit of your health and just confuse everybody. The tools and perks that you're seeing are starter loadouts, with a pistol that barely does anything and a main swing on the sword that's just like a paper cut. That goes under huge change within the first hour of the game. You get given some upgrade slots which then take back to the village and you're given a choice about whether to upgrade that sword. You can even get a shotgun put in and there's just so much double dashes and different areas to explore with your character build that you'll really be up for making sure you're efficiently spending all of those upgrade points and experimenting with a lot of different directions. The sword is particularly cool. There is one build move on it that just takes a little while, but it's a swipe that just goes through loads of them. Very satisfying and also expertly animated as well. And that goes for who you're fighting. It's also not an easy game and it does push back. It's not a roguelike with punishing you with back to the hub, lost everything. You will have restart points, then normally at the start of maybe an underground level or just round the corner of a particularly difficult section. It's got very much a campaign feel and that's cool. Yeah, I love it when indie games get that right, especially with the story and the upgrade system. It can feel really badly paced sometimes if you're dealing with visuals like this and you've just not got that awesome underbelly of sort of upgrades, tight combat, and amazing boss fights, which on this, I haven't shown you any, they're so awesome. They are really good fun and take a while as well. Different attack patterns, open up, layered aggression. It's totally excellent and you will have to communicate and upgrade to take them on. So the revive mechanism feels a little bit broken because you can just bring your mate back when you enter another room, but they will just start with a minimal amount of health. So you'll be stuck in a hard place for a while unless you sort of pull out of there completely, get all your health back and re-approach. But that can breed a sort of recklessness from the other player because they've barely got any life and they just really need to make an impact and it doesn't matter because they'll just be pulled back in the next room. I think a lot of that would change if you had enough upgrades spent on either character. The developers are called Heart Machine. You probably should have mentioned that at the start of the video, and they really got notice for this game. So much so that they're coming out with like a spiritual 3D sequel called Hyperlight Breaker. This one's something to keep an eye out for. It was pushed out on some of those weird E3s we had, I think last year and maybe in March. So it's a pretty new announcement, but it kind of looks pretty fantastic. I'll stick the trailer in the comments. I'm a bit disappointed that we're not gonna see like a 64-bit style sequel to this with just everything beefed up, maybe three player local. You know what I'm talking about, having some like Magicka 2 style graphics, even more size on that map and more variety on the bosses. But yeah, they're gonna go full 3D, and that's probably the end of that. This game's stark beauty and beautifully simplistic gameplay and 
game model is going to be appealing to quite a lot of people i think it's not a roguelike it's got a very solid campaign and if you've got the time a really awesome little story running along in the background of all of this crazy stuff that's happening to you as a character let alone the people that were there before your arrival the game model itself with its stripped down mechanics on things like crafting you don't have to worry about any like finding elements hidden in a damn treasure chest somewhere you're rewarded methodically and those points can be spent on only cool stuff don't have to worry about grinding for a set of something that turns out to be useless and of course your health doesn't come back you do have to make sure you've got your eyes peeled for those packs that are lying around the map and that's quite cool normally it's always a reset and you're not massively punished for taking huge damage of something that you shouldn't have We are actually coming up to the top 15 of the Couch Co-op and Split Screen list, PlayStation 4 and 5, so the next games are all going to be massively strong. We are at number 15, I am Couch Coop, and if there's two things I've learned in this world, it's always take your own food into the cinema, obviously, uh, if you're on a date, just cold food, a few litres of refreshments and dessert ofs, because it's a date, but the other thing is never judge an indie game by its cover or cover art but pixel junk have heritage they are no slouches when it comes to making amazing couch co-op games they had pixel junk shooters 2 which is absolutely stellar and monsters 2 gonna put the links in the comments because those two are kind of sleeper hits huge a little bit older available on playstation 4 but impeccable in their design and look nom nom is completely on par with them giving me so much more than just about all the side-scrolling local co-op platform games that I own. So sit back and allow me to tell you why Nom Nom Galaxy is the top 15 couch co-op game of all time. Strap in or on, this one's gonna be good. Its premise is completely crazy, being a manufacturing world where you are working for a boss who is basically producing soup cans of soup that are getting pushed out to feed planets and the planets have various different tastes and asked which manifest in you having to fetch different types of vegetation to actually put into the machine to then produce the soup cans that get sent via a rocket up to said planet but here comes the fun bit you have to build everything from scratch even the first tile of your base and then from there it's your call on how you play things out you have to look for various pockets of vegetation and you also have to watch out not all of the produce is completely passive you do have some crazy sweet corn creatures and cherry tomato monsters there's a lot of fun to be had just exploring and looking at what the potentially procedurally generated world has offered you. When you replay this game a lot, you do notice patterns when the worlds get produced, but there's still a lot of random drops in the areas, and its campaign promotes that by giving you really cool little presents in and around the map to go to as an incentive. Its second player joining is absolutely flawless as well, allowing no disruption whatsoever to you and being really slick with PSN access and you can have a guest profile. It's so perfect to split up the different tasks, have someone fetching and gathering as the massive plethora of things that you have to build suggests it's really about automation and having other things doing stuff for you you have these little walking joe like charlie robots that are epic they will carry things but they're very slow but if you have enough of them you actually just start manufacturing on a conveyor level and the fruit gets thrown in at one end of your structure and all gets manufactured and put through the system without you even having to go near it it's so incredible as a goal to get to on a level that automation goes very crazy and the machinery that you get access to that you research that you develop is like sit on ride on massive tractor vacuum spaceship things you saw the mcfly hoverboard at the beginning shotguns swords 
there is so much meta with the items and the bubblegum mechanic that I'm going to explain, which runs alongside the whole budgetary system. Those are those figures over on the left, and you share it. So you will run out, you can run out of money halfway through like building a ladder that you're stuck up, and someone will have to just go and get money so you can continue to build yourself back to safety. Because here's the other crux there is full damage everywhere. This whole map suffers from gravity, that goes on structures and of course yourself. It also has the most infuriating day and night system, causing all the workers to stop. The game just shuts down, <laughs> gives you a bunch of stats. Any perishable fruit or veg that you had harvested will disappear unless it's in refrigeration, that's so cool. You have to get giant fridges to put all of your material in. This game is nuts. If you've never gone near it, you're probably wondering how excavation works. And it's on the other stick, and it's just this buzzsaw that's got this radius on it, 360. Not too much reach, but it allows you to just go anywhere very quickly but excavating can cause all manner of disruption with the material above it, causing landslides, avalanche style trapping material will just come down on your head, it's great, you have to then get dug out. So while all this is going on in the background, you're competing with a phantom sort of AI producer of soup, who is also trying to feed the same people on the planet, and that is the percentage up on the top right. You have to come up with new suit combinations because the people on the planet may change their tastes halfway through the game, which really can disrupt your production. And you can lay down a suit manufacturing unit that's kind of a blank canvas and put in what you find and kind of predict how trends are going to go. This game is so deep with how much you've got to do at the same time that you can play it for hours without even getting remotely frustrated with any of it. Death is actually handled quite well, with not being massively disruptive, but ruining your kind of day a bit, because you'll drop all of your items that you're carrying, quite a lot of money will get spilled on the ground, and you'll spawn back at the base. And it will just be like, if you're halfway through something, and you fall off a ladder by accident, it does feel a bit punishing, which is very cool, but it doesn't disrupt the flow of what you're trying to achieve as a greater goal. What will constantly disrupt you though are the enemies that are sent by the AI player in the form of like Space Invaders style little pig's heads and funny green robots coming down from above onto your base. So you have to build turrets and defense, more automation there, they fire on their own but they require you to reload and they're not cheap. You've got a one eye on the sky and another on all this internal and excavation mining that you're doing beneath the base. This is an absolutely perfect family game, or a couples game, partner game. It is so cool on the fact that there's no major violence in it. There is a funny little rivalry story going on, and the online is completely robust with some very cool options. And you can also go to a mode that just allows you an almost muck about in a generated planet, and you can explore different builds start really going down some major routes, but what I enjoy most is the campaign. It's brilliantly structured, it's totally made for two people. It does look incredible. This is all five footage, and it's a game that's very old, but every detail is impeccable. Been looking at it so much lately, trying to work out if they've sort of skimped on things or made things a bit shallow in areas. There's nothing that you can turn your nose up with when it comes to that brilliant meta mechanic with the bubble gum and the currencies, terraforming your own little base on your own little planet really gives it that ownership. And if you're both putting things together, you feel attached to the structure and you communicate in which directions you want to take it. It's a very good game to bond and it's got so much playtime in it. You're talking 200 plus hours, easily 200 plus. 
This one is significant because we've just had a sequel release to it and I'm gonna dovetail it into this video. There's also a link to Salt and Sacrifice in the description because it's a newer game, but I wanted to show you guys this one because it's kind of where it all started and they got so much right with it. Salt and Sanctuary is actually a Soulsborne. And what that means is it's a game that has a lot of similar mechanics to the Dark Souls or the Bloodborne series from from software. Just as we've got it on screen in the background there was the infamously convoluted additional player mechanic that this game has put in to get local co-op working. You have to choose an item within your character setup at the beginning, otherwise you can't do it. The item can be found though within about 15 to 25 minutes of early game. Let's get back to that Soulsborne analogy. I've made two lists on Soulslikes games, so I'll put the annotation in, but this one manages to have only Dark Souls mechanics in its gameplay. Some Souls like sort of cherry pick, maybe the bonfire mechanic, it might be some of the combat or some of that focus, but this is a side scroller that manages the unfathomable, which is to make a complete side scroll in Dark Souls game. And not only does it work, but it's better on Couch Co op. The sequel, Salt and Sacrifice, has a different color palette, and that's something I want to talk about. There was a time in 2016 where it was kind of trendy to have really drab, weird browns and greys, a whole theme wiped across a whole game with certain colour palettes. And I think Salt and Sanctuary fell into that category, but it totally works with the game. But it also gives the sequel this very vivid uh, new look, which makes it a lot more different when it comes to working out who you are, seeing enemies. It's a very new idea for the series as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not sure how to take it, because it does make it look like almost a generic platformer. And that's my point with this video, neither of these games are generic platformers. They are so cool with their level design, think huge map that has a Metroid style, find special keys, you can go down as far as you can go up, it's massive, you've got to do it all with memory, there's no real map screen, so it's very Souls-like in taking those awesome risks in a direction where you're not sure if you're going to make it back. You might have a lot of salt, which is the Souls equivalent in these games, and I love that risk reward. It makes it so much better with somebody else who's also getting more and more worried, the enemies are getting tougher and tougher, is it time to turn in and go back to the bonfire? Both of these games have a extremely detailed and robust weapon system with melee and range with the sequel, but it's all about one-handed, two-handed stances, different shield upgrades, using maces, single-handed swords, pikes, everything is so detailed on that front and it's really important. You think of a game like Trine where it's just completely two-dimensional, looks beautiful, but you've got none of that background depth and if you find a cool drop or if you get an amazing set of armor, it looks totally different on your character and you can even open some unbelievably vicious moves, including overhead slams and the dodge and roll also works. The game comes with a hilarious little finisher move on circle which just warms my cockles every time. I wanted to talk about the idea of builds with this game as well, having starter characters influencing what road you go down when it comes to upgrading on the weaponry. As with all Souls games, you get this sort of advantage if you go for certain character types, and there is the mage magic projectile area to explore, but my favourite is of course close quarters, melee, shield bashing and guarding and just getting in there. It's so cool for that, and especially if you're both doing it. And the bosses, they push back brilliantly. The lack of color in your character differential between the two of you can sometimes get a bit confusing. And those symbols above your heads are gray, but they're kind of immersion destroying for me. And the same goes for the sequel, and I think they can be toggled on and off. If you're playing with someone who's not used to this style of game, it's pretty handy because if you're very close together, timing is everything. You need to make sure your shield's up if a big blow is coming in, and that dodge and roll is extremely important. And they've blended it all in with some great air hang time mechanics, a bit like Devil May Cry, where you can stay elevated if you're doing some speedy moves. Which game would I recommend? Well, here's the strange thing. The original game is still more money on the PlayStation Store than its brand new sequel. So if you've got budgetary issues and you want to see most of this game's awesomeness 
go to the sequel and it's a bit more user friendly and you'll kind of hit the ground running with the difficulty curve because again it's not as punishing as the original if you kind of really like what you're seeing here and you want to go from the beginning with all this i totally recommend going for sanctuary first it's very cool and exploring what they've changed with the two games or just seeing all of the bosses and all of the cool levels there's like cthulhu and lovecraft influences in the original totally worth it owning them both is just awesome because there's so much content there i would say 50 to 70 hours on the original and 100 at least on the sequel because you've got all that online there's a lot of re-roll stuff and challenges to be had it's a very big game also What other couch co-op games are out there that are like this? Well, the truth is, there's barely any. I'm thinking like stuff like maybe Strider, like Blazing Chrome, but nowhere near. You know, this isn't a Contra clone. This is a side-scrolling hack and slash that is deeply, deeply playing homage to the entire Dark Souls series. So it's kind of its own animal. This is us making the strategic decision to scuttle back to the bonfire to buy more cool stuff with all of the salt that we got from killing the boss. And that had to be a group decision. A lot of you want to just keep pushing, but it's really cool to see that massive skill tree and start talking to each other about synergies, what direction are you gonna go in. It's a really cool idea to have both upgrade trees independent of each other when they're being used, and just the loot and the amazing items and the crazy enemies and their outlandish, unapologetic gore. The wonderful... I knew we forgot someone. You. We're gonna look at a number of different Sony ports of this game. It came out on the PlayStation 4 and Pro as a remaster about two years ago now. And then I put it over to the 5 and we did see a patch, some amazing free DLC come in, which I'll talk about later. But there are major differences. Everything's 1080, but we do have a beautiful push for 60 frames per second over on the PlayStation 5, which is hella noticeable with a game that's this busy. Whilst we're looking at older footage, let me explain what this game's all about. You basically have free control on your left analog stick, and then your right analog stick allows you to free draw objects. Simple ones, a straight line, a circle, an L shape. They all produce various weapons. You unlock them as you go through the game, and there is a slowdown mechanic placed around a lot of the single player content. But it's the parry and the pace of the game that kind of steals the show. You have buttons on L2, R2 that turn you into a blancmange, or a spring, or a ball to even get you out of trouble and everything just makes you smile. It's blended perfectly together with that beautiful platinum shine. And talking of shine, let's have a look at the PlayStation 5 local co-op performance in an identical location. So as with all Platinum titles, I kind of own them twice because they go and release platform exclusives in the form of Nintendo Switch games or even Wii U games. This was an exclusive Wii U game that then got remastered and kind of released. And I wonder if Nintendo have got that kind of deal going forward with Platinum because Bayonetta 3 is going to come out just on that Switch, which is criminal. We're not going to get to see that game perform on a decent machine for a very long time. No diss to Switch owners, but you know what I'm talking about. This Switch release of this game does not perform anything like the base level PlayStation 4 version. And the 5 version is just a whole new level. It's totally next gen for a remaster. I very much enjoy it. Okay, enough blambering. Tell us why this game made it to your top 13 Couch Corp and PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 games. It's got everything that I want from an ARPG and a twin stick and a platinum game. It's blended all of their greatest, brilliant Clover Studio games like Akami and Beautiful Joe and pushed them all into a modern isometric local co-op game, which is like no other on the market because of the variation on what these weapons produce. And it's got that snappy parry that you see in platinum games and the imagination behind 
the bosses and the level design there's nothing else like it the camera's always whipping in and out on zoom and you're discovering little tiny urban toy like villages and just looking at the detail on things like the pavement tiny little shatter mechanics and tumbling on the enemies when you hit them or parry them back from a move the narrator is spot on with his cheesiness and making you feel like you are a whole bunch of ragtag superheroes all pulling together to play this ridiculous story out which is just unfathomable all of the boss fights especially with some of the first person shooting zones are absolutely brilliant but i'm always likes to switch the game model up if you played near automata you know what i'm talking about I'm going to finish up with some stunning PlayStation 5 footage. That last whole clip was PlayStation 4 Pro and it's so refreshing to see the change. One thing I will make a particular point of and what I feel is very important is that coming up now with 12, 11 and 10 and then coming into the top 10, these games are going to have to earn their merit as single player pieces of software as well. And this is up there in Platinum's amazing roster of like five or six games that they've produced over the last 10 years. This is absolutely award-winning stuff from them and not to be ignored even on a single player level. To bowl it in with local co-op and make it better, more communication, faster, more hectic action on screen, it's just a dream come true. Could rattle on more about why it's so good haven't even spoken about its economy and the shop system and opening up new moves by spending money and getting new skills having a new morph mechanic added to your game like halfway through is totally epic the time attack mode that's been added for free is blinding it's a mixture of all the levels you can play couch co-op so if you finish the game and you just want to have loads of fun hop in there it is so hard though that's one thing about this game is that you might want to slip it onto easy if you've got younger ones that you want to introduce it to and then on the sly whack it back to normal we've all been guilty of that I also think if you haven't heard of Platinum before and want a taste of what their games are all about, Akami, Bayonetta and Vanquish. I'll put links in the descriptions, annotations, all that material because they are so worth looking at as a studio. They really do have a sort of high success rate. They have some real clangers out there and they've had a lot of stuff cancel on them but thankfully everything is fine with the wonderful 101 remaster on PlayStation 5, on PlayStation 4 and it's got some enhancements for the Pro. Is there anything I don't like about the game? Well, it's done me over a little bit on the cloud save. I've had to restart it countless times. This game is a bit weird on its save file system with the two machines. It tries to sort of push that whole touchpad Wii U, work a problem out by having to shake the damn controller around area of gaming we had to navigate. Motion controller madness. So Crozer has a superpower. I want to make the important point that the game's content is basically split right down the middle for the entire campaign for two people on split screen. It's absolutely excellent. Games like Borderlands would do this. It's phenomenal to get all of that content shared and enjoy it with someone else. This is PlayStation 4 Pro footage and you will see in the distance on some of the limbs of the ants a little bit of resolution loss. The game kind of chugs a little bit. It's minor performance issues fall away when you realise what the game's trying to do and the size of some of the original and how tall a lot of your enemies and foes are, destructible buildings everywhere. And that campaign is such a roller coaster, you've barely got time to look back. You're too busy fighting giant tarantulas and dung beetles from hell. I like the insect aesthetic, I think it's really cool. It kind of reminds me of the older films, and they don't hold back from pushing a bit of Xeno in. It's a great blend between giant kaiju robots, killer alien monsters, and hybrid massive insects you're never bored. The earlier games are not as user friendly. You didn't get instant access to all this maneuverability, certainly not that jetpack, and you have like a two button super mode which really just turns you into a complete 
gun platform. Iron Rain is a real sweet spot for accessibility. I kind of love introducing people to it who aren't familiar with split screen and how off the hook it can be or crazy looking. This one will just impress. It's so gorgeous when it's going full pelt. And some of the explosions and updates we've seen, especially with this high boosted PlayStation 5 version with no screen tearing and no frame dips, it feels very smooth. Are any of the other games worth going back to? I own one of them physical, I can't remember, they bought out like a point something, I think it might have been around four or three. Personally, this one is my favorite. There is a newer version, but I feel that this is kind of the sweet spot. The older games are not as flashy as this. Iron Rain on launch, I remember, was like, we're rolling out our best one, biggest one, most beautiful one yet on the PlayStation 4, and it sold like hotcakes, huge in Japan, and it's so cool to see it get more and more popular over here in Europe and the US. Spread out and only attack its head and legs. Stop it in its tracks. There's only one other third person split screen action shooter that kind of topples this, but it, you know what I'm talking about. It's a platform exclusive. This is going to kind of be PS4 and PS5. And to tell you the truth, this game is so blinding, it should be so much higher. But in my mind, I want to get it out of the way because I feel you guys need to see it. And that top 10 is coming up. The next one's 11, and I've got the 10 in my brain. It's just number 11, I've got like seven games to choose from. I wanted to touch on the progression and the unlocks and the ideas behind some of the meta game. First off, there's a huge amount of customization for going out online and showing off your really cool sets or a really cool weapon skin or just some cool new thing that you've put on like a ballot club. It's really crazy deep because of its Japanese heritage. That cosmetic area is deep AF. But there's also a very good weapon unlock tree which pushes you onto some very crazy weapons. Some of them are alien. It gets huge. You're talking missiles launching at multiple levels coming out of like cluster bombs. It goes crazy. I don't want to show you too many because I haven't unlocked them all. <laughs> So therein lies my weakness. It's so difficult to put down because of its brilliant economy and wanting to unlock a new weapon and spend all your gems on something very cool to take to the next mission. It's almost got a Monster Hunter-like vibe on that front with your loot, getting stuff from a cool mission, even replaying a mission to get some great accolades. The end of level screens and the scoring system is like something you'd see from Capcom or a Platinum game. It's huge and it's very competitive as well to make sure that you're thrashing the other player on points and just being a better badass. Laura Croft Tomb Raider 1 on the PlayStation 1 and I was gobsmacked by these graphics. Gobsmacked! It is actually genuinely quite difficult to tell what's going on, but back then we didn't care. This game was very large on a graphical prowess. When it came out, it was kind of the thing, and it was pushing the little PlayStation 1 to the maximum. But more importantly, it starred a brand new character that we'd all seen on the fronts of the magazines with glasses on and the funny spiky chin. No, Miss Jacqueline Natler does from Natla Technologies. That does not sound like a forced southern drawl at all. And the tech, the tubular build of her and all of the NPCs, is not that big a jump from 1987's Money For Nothing video, I was thinking. Tech had not gone on that far in those years. Vast mountain ranges to cover, sheer walls of ice. Why are you telling us all this? Well, I want to make it clear that the Laura Croft series or any Tomb Raider game were never couch co-op it was never a focus and it was so cool to see this weird isometric come out called Laura Croft and the Temple of Osiris in Egyptian mythology the god king Osiris unified the kingdoms and ruled with wisdom and justice a very solid promotion on four people even on two people this game splits up the kind of tasks and equipment that you have to both players equally meaning that the puzzles involve everybody it's very clever and it's one of the few twin sticks because it technically is that I can cope with that's puzzle heavy 
There's a few reasons for that. They're very well designed and they have a visual appeal to their solution. And it's quite cool, quite Indiana Jonesy, being in these Egyptian temples, scarabs running around, and just working out switches, environments, and using the different elements and moves that the two characters have. What you saw just then we'll come back to in a minute, all right? Don't worry about all those lines on the screen. I want to talk about the infantry system and how detailed it is with slots and points and loads of different choice of equipment. It's very RPG focused in that direction, not a shallow twin stick puzzler by any stretch. So the split of equipment works first of all on the projectile weapon. So someone will have the staff which fires a beam and it's used to sort of hurt enemies and work out puzzles. So you'll always need the other person to sort of get rid of these orbs. The game really leans on hidden areas and hidden items and very cool bits of equipment or a nice amulet that's gonna give you a buff in a direction hitting them all over all of the levels right from the get-go, you're immediately thinking there's replay here. The second bit of strange equipment is like a triangle bomb that you put down and then detonate with the second hit. It's hella satisfying in combat and you've both got them. They can be quite dangerous. Also, the person with the staff can turn into like a solid block sphere, which allows you one sort of jump up a level notch when they change into that form. Giving the other player access to like higher le jumps or levels that weren't a thing before and playing this on your own and jostling with all of those mechanics is pretty damn daunting. It's quite clever how they've managed it and of course when there's four people on screen everyone knows their role. It's very cool when a puzzle comes up because people are rallying to provide a solution. Anyways, what's going on? I haven't even seen a single gun get fired yet. And that's where it's got me. It's got flawless range combat and some amazing like skeletal monster-like Egyptian creatures coming at you all the time. The shooting mechanics are solid. It feels a little bit like the ascent. You know what you're capable of, what your range is. There's no real friendly fire unless you're putting those bombs down. And they integrate a lot of the projectile weaponry and bombs into the puzzle. At no point does this feel like you're playing a little, you know, double A or indie game. It feels so polished and so interesting. There's so much going on on screen with the colours and the bullets and the power-ups and your loadouts. You feel your buffs working on different amulets that you've slotted in. It's kind of incredible, really. It also promotes mixing things up a lot and it will put you into a chase scene all of a sudden it will move the camera around there'll be a giant crocodile coming after you it doesn't stop with keeping you guessing about what the hell is it going to do to you next and here's a great working example of your third sort of puzzle solution provider or PSP it's like a winch slash rope thing it's very cool how you implement it you fire it over gaps only Lara has it so you have to work with each other to see how you're going to get other places you can pull someone up with it or lower them down it's a very cool idea with traversing ledges the tension kind of builds it doesn't snap they can't fall off but with everything i do struggle with a lot of the controls with the game i'm lecturing lewis about not dying here and that's lewis that makes it through Final One thing I'm not going to show you on this video is the bosses, the end of level and mid level bosses. They're extremely story driven and character focused. They have loads of dialogue, it's crazy. The environment works in conjunction with their attacks. Everything's like a huge innate puzzle in itself, so they're very cool. When I first saw footage of this game, I was convinced it was a mobile game. It did get an official console release in the beginning. Praising a mobile phone game is a little bit like being into a piece of music and then realizing it was written by Peter Andre. This is also one of the games I recommend playing through on your own. It's very cool. And if you only have someone around, you know, once in a blue moon, it's a perfect one to fire up and get them involved on. You do need a profile. You can't join on the fly, but there's so much back end to your character development, all these different Uzis and weapons Laura can get new pistols, there's outfits, there's crazy new staffs and a whole plethora of really cool loot to find. 
Though I did get some lines coming up on the PlayStation 5 version of the game. It's the first time it's ever happened to me with a PlayStation 4 game that I've had an actual visual issue. The game does say, what are you doing playing this from 2014 on your new PlayStation 5? So only when we got to the Uzi, it went a bit weird. All this other footage is PlayStation 5, so I think you're okay. What a stunning local co-op twin stick this is. You might recognize a lot of its sights and sounds. It is a housemark game. It's one of their earlier. It could be for me the high point of the indie side of the studio. It's a complete joy to play. It's fast and furious and it boasted some very head of the game graphics back then when it was first launched on the base level PlayStation 4. We're going to look at a few versions of the game as well including the pro and four player footage. Why is it at number 10? What separates it from the 15 other games that you've been talking about? Well it's this loot system and customization on class and weapon type. You can pump down certain routes of power up that you want with a particular gun and the class that you choose be it heavy or quick also have a special skill tree that has loads of options and visual changes in the attacks that you see come into the gameplay so well you're like I cannot wait to get to the next level because I've got all these points to spend it is a perfectly pitched system to keep you wanting to go to the next stage of the game to see what your character builder is going to come out with and whether they're going to cope with the hordes of unforgiving enemies that just come flying at you this is has got to be one of the most impressive looking twin sticks out there. On the subject of the visuals, we're now looking at the base level PlayStation 4 two player version of the game it runs very well, no issues, no lag, no frame drops. Just like Resogun or anything else in their back catalog, performance is paramount. It's slick, smooth, even on that base level PlayStation 4. I think Housemart's mission is try to create that arcade perfect experience, both visually and on a gameplay level. This is so much more than an arcade game because of its switch out on environments and it's really ahead of its time sort of mid-level smaller bosses that are leveled up that drop top tier loot that are really worth your while you have to seek them out on the map brilliant idea it does keep you on your toes on that front the enemies and various things that you're dealing with coming your way have stayed surprisingly fresh and they haven't recycled a lot of this I thought you'd see some maybe repeats in games like Ex Machina or Mountfall but this is kind of a standalone <laughs> took a slug of whiskey before doing that don't recommend it i was trying to say that this is kind of a standalone thing with all of its designs its guns weaponry that exosuit and the environments it's really out there in its own island of ideas it's not in canon with anything they've ever done now on to playstation 4 pro footage this is 1080 smooth af and it's a fantastic four player game the camera is a little bit close newer four player twin sticks have an adjustment but it's okay if you know what's coming and you know how to deal with a lot of the enemies it's not too too much of a worry but if newbies are playing this <laughs> He's just screwed. The reload system is a hacktick on clicking one of the sticks. Getting your head around that on its own or explaining that to somebody who's not used to the idea takes a long time. Surprisingly enough, this game doesn't actually receive any PlayStation 5 boost. That might be due to its age. It's 1080 and at a lock 30 frames per second when you look it up. Next Machima does, it has a beautiful 4K and a 60 frame pick. I wonder if they'll ever get to this, it's kind of maybe a bit too far back in their back catalog, but wow, it still looks stunning to the eye when playing it on a PlayStation 5. I can also confirm no glitches or issues. We did see some in Temple of Osiris on the most recent video with some strange lines coming up when this game saved. It wasn't game breaking, it was just a strange thing to see. But, and it's just nice to see that there isn't any issues at all with the backwards compatibility of Alienation on the PlayStation 5. <laughs> If I painted myself into a corner with this list, I've got nine more games to talk about. Are there any more amazing couch co-op split screen or local co-op games out there on the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5? Hell yes! I've got loads. There's, I've got more than nine. So, you know, there's going to be casualties. Talking of casualties, we, we died a lot. This is me and Lewis. Obviously, the reload system was the first hurdle, and then the revive, you have to clear the area. It's not like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles where the whole game shuts down unless you bring your other player back. This is hardcore, nasty stuff where you'll just get swarmed everything. You've got to clear the area. There is a countdown, so the tension's there. <laughs> Thank you.
What would I compare this game to on a twin stick level? And it's a difficult one there. It is quite close to Next Machina's sister title. And it does feel quite a lot like Matterfall. Matterfall is a side-scrolling, non-local co-op game. Really worth picking up if you're into Housemark because it's defo physical. This is a solid PlayStation exclusive still. Before you'd pushed a single button, you knew you were dealing with something special when Helldivers fired up. A legend. All right, let's get to the meta, because this is more than a twin stick game. Obviously, ground in a brilliant sci-fi universe. You have a choice of planet that you visit. It can be one of three races. Now, this is the first thing that knocked me back, was how fleshed out the three races. Almost like Warhammer level of differential with these guys. You've got the bugs, i.e. the starship, Geiger, slash killer lobster aliens. You've also got robotic, future-style, very advanced Android SY. Everything looks very clean and dangerous. So then you've got these ragtag, almost junk-style robots who are like brutish, orcish direction. A real good contrast of three amazing races to fight. You'll notice, and the clue is also in the name, that everything's coming in from above. You yourself come in, you and your team will be dropped in, and any supplies or health, special perks, robots, will all have to be dropped in at the start of the level this creates such chaos because a drop can kill you you can't be in the wrong place at the wrong time it's instant death this just breeds all manner of panic because you need room you need time some drops take longer than others and you have to remember sometimes quite a complicated series of button inputs The game also comes with a very addictive skill point system and finishing the level, getting your XP, getting to the next rung of rank that gives you access to more badass weaponry and armor and look, it all bowls in to make the game quite a solid RPG experience, nearly spilled my coffee. All of this is done in the Star Hub which has also got your little tubes that you get fired down to the planet from and you can also decide where you want to be dropped. I love the idea of this, you can start molding your experience by just going straight next to the objective or do what I do and try and be you know out the way in the corner not disturbing anything it never works out Helldivers knows you're trying to do that and will just swamp you early doors this is just so good it feels procedural it feels like an AI director you never have the same game twice with spawn points and enemies and they also have an alert system which means if you bugger about don't get rid of them all they'll just call in a hell of a lot more and things get a lot worse this is us just getting our crap together at the start of the mission. And that brings me on to its next unique selling point, a compulsory friendly fire mode. You cannot take this off and half of the game's ideas are spawned by not being able to fire at something because your mates stand in square in the way. It also incorporates this into the controls on a genius level, giving almost like an ascent two-tier combat, meaning if you're crawling around on your stomach after hitting the square button, you can't be hit by any fire above your head. You'll be having to do it constantly if you're with someone who's not really aware of those rules because you'll get dropped so fast if you take friendly fire on board. And the better your gun, technically, the more dangerous it is to everybody else on pitch. Very quick touch on environmental map differential. You don't see any like got to drink water in a desert or wear different attire on the cold worlds, but you do see some really cool volcanic behavior and some nice variation in greenery. You go to quite a lot of different places. You also go to a freaking bug homeworld, and this game is full of bosses, really scary ones. You get a jetpack, spoiler alert. <laughs> Here's our next point, and you may have noticed it from the footage, the game is ridiculously difficult. The game does not care if you are not having a good time. It's too busy being hell divers. It's your job to make sure you smash it and get through the levels and get better equipment because it just will not stop being horrible to you. It loves it so much. That attracts me massively. What is it? Stockholm Syndrome almost because when we discovered this, to have it online or to have it local co-op doesn't change anything. It's still just as good and have someone else try and sort of fight this what seems to be unwinnable fight is what I think good local co-op is all about. Its mission structure is worth talking about. You have different tasks on the map. It randomizes this as well. Some of them might be hack a sort of missile, 
silo or it might be protect an area or even deliver a briefcase and that's the nightmare scenario because one of you has got their main weapon taken away and moves a bit slow it's an escort style mission and this is re-rolled so well that you're never really thinking ah oh, i've got this again I suppose we should talk about the vehicles and how awesome the mechs are the tank the jumpsuit everything that's called in is opened up by developing your character and it gets so amazing but you do have a complicated button input and pulling these things in mid combat can be very difficult but once you're all, all on board things just go absolutely crazy it goes full smash tv and throws the kitchen sink at you but it's great fun because your vehicle can just crush things under your feet again there is still friendly fire you will be hitting that square button a lot if you've got an inexperienced friend firing liberally their milligun right across the entire map screen we did have a little switcheroo on rolls within the tank it does take two hell divers it's pretty amazing and getting your head around the controls with the two sticks ie you have actual tank controls both sticks forward full steam ahead one stick forward does the turn in the relative direction both sticks back is reverse i was like whoa this the, why don't all games have their tank controls like that <laughs> slight friendly fire incident there and yes you guessed it if your other player is lost you then have to call them in with a beacon that takes time to throw and to drop in and you've got to avoid where it drops in until you get them back and the game will sometimes be like this ain't happening <laughs> this ain't happening today it needs to be credited for having online and couch co-op blended flawlessly into the gameplay model. You can call in a random by putting down an SOS beacon. Remember, there are trolls out there and pulling a random into this game can just result in a versus twin stick shooter where everybody's just trying to kill everybody because someone shot someone in the back of the head by accident. It also has this strange live action war going on. So whenever you log in, you're sort of brought up to speed. It acts as a sort of reroll system on what galaxy you get to visit, meaning you won't always be having to be in the bug system. I think all three races have their home world. So the objective is for that mini season to to try and get to the end of that campaign structure. I have also left the PlayStation 5 mention to the end of the video. This does have some semi boosts with the machine, giving you 4K and a PEG 60 is totally noticeable with it as well. Helldivers was never a performance offender, but it's great to have that lick of quality. up this list is now gaining momentum if you've just stumbled across me because youtube has been doing a brilliant job of bearing my content lately it would be great if i could have you on board as a subscriber seven six five four three two and one are going to be amazing comic crash 2 the cronkoid wars is amazing okay let's get a bit serious now i have never seen this game on a single couch co-op local co-op list i've never seen it on ign i've never heard of it really on the indie circuit or being pushed its content on any other couch co-op youtube channel it's crazy it's like a secret sect people who are into this it's and get this it's one of the best real-time rts's available on console full stop half the reason i own a pc is for rts games real-time strategy that stands for obviously and for editing and for amazing graphics but the only other reason i have a pc is for stuff like starcraft really cool warhammer material can the original subscriber who recommended this to me put a comment in on this because it's been years now and i still go back to this game all the time and if you hadn't have pointed this out to me there's just no way i would have come across it via default no way okay i need to explain how this game is working because what you're seeing is probably a little bit confusing to a lot of people who haven't gone anywhere near this or this type of game and this also does boil down to technically being a tower defense game also so have that thought in your brain with the game's structure you can see that there's a color code system on these buildings the blue buildings are mine and i'm that little spaceship running around collecting these asteroids and i'm dumping them in my harvesters to allow me to build barracks bigger guns more protection and then i'm going to push all of my resources into attacking units and i'm going to send them over to the other person's base thus giving you a win so this structure is bled out into the campaign now the campaign is co-op and it's one of my favorite things about the entire game itself every single map has got a sort of submission timed and side quest and you may even have a boss to deal with as well or you may even have another ai player doing all the same stuff that you're trying to do 
Now let's get to its meta, because there's still more to explain. You have a build menu, and you heard me mention about harvesters. It's your call to have as many harvesters as you want, or where to put them, and there's an unlimited amount of asteroids that will drift onto the screen. The screen never moves, the asteroids come in from the exterior, and it's your job to grab them. You have a little R2 hook, and take them over to your harvester. It also works with quite a lot of sort of low gravity physics and you can send the asteroid over without having to actually chaperone the damn thing. So the front end of the game is this crazy rush to get as many asteroids on board as possible because you're going to start building defenses because the other player is going to start sending over little robots that are going to smash into your base. How on earth do you do all this with two sticks? That's one of the genius things is that all your aggressive behavior is on one wheel on one side and your build menus on an R button and on the other stick. So you have free analog control to run around. There is a certain amount of granular arcade action when you're both going for the same boulder and <laughs> stealing each other's material or even building nearer the other person's base. How does it work with your units then? You only ever control this spaceship and when you're sending in enemies to attack the base, they only obey a particular route that cannot be blocked. They can always get to your base. It's your job to sort of concertina and cause a real headache to the other player's bots to get to your base by making the journey longer and more arduous by putting down big tower defense materials, even air to ground guns, and just causing as much annoyance to the opposition as possible. This would be done by sort of zigzagging building structures or putting a lot around your base, but remember you have to allow that one tile to let the other person in to actually attack. So with all that in mind, we're going to look at some local co-op three player footage. Now I know I'm piling it on a little bit here, but I need to make sure I pitch this game or sell it to you guys well, because it's the default for anybody who's a non-gamer who comes around. Everybody I've shown it to are like, I love this. I want to play this for hours. Let's do the co-op campaign. Let's have a go at versus and explore some high-end builds. Let's not attack each other for the first 10 minutes, which never works out. But look at the craziness going on here we each have a corner almost and the color correspondence is on the bases you can see blue bottom left you can see green top right and that represents the same ship type we're all running around trying to grab boulders trying to put them in our harvesters and some of us have set up ground to air guns which actually fire upon the enemy ship which means you can't be hovering over someone else's base stealing their asteroid there's so many options for defenses and if you look in the bottom left you'll see that yellow has sent a crap ton of stuff over to blue which i think is me and they'll all pile in you have a few amount of hits but you take too many and it's over. Joe Biden, try to walk it back. Because of my extreme competitiveness and love for PvP, the campaign is something I always plug to avoid. But going in and looking at the content is absolutely amazing. It also acts as a tutorial, giving you certain levels and introducing different mechanics and building types or vehicle types and sort of teaching you how to use them. And incidentally, every single structure that you put down can actually be upgraded up to three tiers. Somebody who's like a company of heroes veteran or is like big on Age of Empires 3 will look at this simplicity and turn their nose up at it and just be like, no, I need more depth when it comes to a real-time strategy. Once you scratch past this initial front-end layer, the meta game is so deep. If you're good at this game, the decisions you have to make on the fly and the directions you have to go in very quickly are amazing. Yours. So it came out in 2017 and I've been googling all afternoon and looking for some thread, something about the team and another game from them and there's absolutely nothing. I cannot believe Comic Crash 3 has not been pumped out yet. They could get away with having exactly this system but just with some upgraded you know, models and assets. I would be so up for that. Change nothing, just give it a lick of pain. <laughs> This game has beaten some mammoths in my top 25. Remember, it's a ranked list, and a lot of you might be quite surprised at how passionate I am about the Cronkoid Wars. I feel so lucky to know about it, and I cannot thank that person enough. It's playing on the couch against somebody is my earliest couch co-op offline kind of memory. And we have to look at the terminology here. When I say couch co-op and I'm referring to these sorts of games, I do mean versus. Very few of them actually have, you know, two of you against the AI. It is not a common thing seen in the genre, but I want to touch on one of the earlier and probably the coolest fighter available on the PlayStation 4. I know it's a matter of opinion, but Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is legendary. Hey, 
It's funny, there's kind of a few tiers of fire. There's what's called flare fighters, which are all about being airborne quite a lot and having a very large character roster and even taking that character roster on pitch and having a depth of different options to go to during an actual game. I would say Guilty Gears of Flare Fighter, maybe some of the Blaze Blue, older and recent stuff, but basically loud, flashy, huge moveset, a lot of airborne combat, and specials that stop the whole game <laughs> for about three seconds. <laughs> Having all of that in mind when looking at what we're seeing here, at the top of the screen you can see the character roster. So there's six players that are available to fight this, three on each team, and you can roll or scroll through them with the shoulder buttons and when they're in trouble you can pull them out and they get a bit of health back when they're kind of sitting out of ring it's like a tag team thing and man the depth it gives you because at the bottom of the screen you've also got your level that you've reached on each character from dealing damage that opens up huge winning specials there's a hell of a lot of resource management going on during this what seems like just a loud brash standard fighter It is a thousand miles from any Street Fighter or even Mortal Kombat Western fighting game. It's a whole new world and the airborne combat in itself and getting used to how to parry and queuing up moves is unbelievable. I was thinking about my competitor reviewers, ACG, Skiller, the big boys. They don't know what they're talking about with fighters, they don't. I'm a Justin Wong man. I was there right at the beginning, Street Fighter 3 Alpha. It's so embedded in me and it's really part of my couch cop heritage. Talking of heritage, the character roster in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is unbelievably mind-blowing. This is where I can go to play as Dante while switching out to Beautiful Joe and then having Chris Redfield on the old R button. And it's Resident Evil 5 Redfield, the badass one with all the grenades and electrifying equipment. It's totally amazing. Two Resident Evil characters in here, including Nemesis, which is well scary. He's got some really awesome moves and the developers really took a personal touch with each of these characters. The Akami Wolf is so amazing with its specials and the lifted samples from the game and Beautiful Joe, just some of the moves that he implements within Marvel vs Capcom 3 are totally in line with the moves that he had in his original game and he features nowhere else on the planet now by the way. <laughs> So back to my original point, if you're playing this locally versus, it's huge. Not only on a nostalgia level, but on a tactics level. And you and the person against you are going to really find yourself heading down this huge rabbit hole, which opens up on a tier basis. And before you know it, you're going to be like flying around in the air doing these like epic clashes about 50 feet above the actual battleground itself and doing show-stopping specials and finishing off bouts with huge moves. It's your you will smile the whole way through. And the Marvel homages are awesome, including Wolverine still being in the series. Do not get the new Marvel vs. Capcom game. Okay, we've switched out to 2022, and this is the PlayStation 5 version of Mortal Kombat 11, and I took the opportunity to get quite a few of the add-on characters. Don't normally like doing those sort of transactions, but with fighters, if they're good enough, and they were on offer at the time, I picked them all up. It was damned amazing. Only person I'm missing is Rambo. Not a huge loss. Fan service is crazy good, with all of them having their own interactive ending scenes, depending on what sort of brutality you deliver, and it really gave me a boost on the whole package itself, because there's not that stronger roster on base game with Mortal Kombat 11. Here's the thing with Mortal Kombat and Couch Versus, compared to that previous game, this is almost like a two-dimensional control system, giving you really rudimentary and easily reached moves and moves that mimic some of the Street Fighter setup. So someone who's got muscle memory in that direction will fall into Mortal Kombat quite quickly. And that's very important. You've got to remember that you have to go through that initial induction process with your mate if they're new to it and if they're that annoyed with the game they won't like it and play it with you so having small moves that give them those breadcrumbs that then lead on to big specials and finishes totally acts as a good incentive. We do all have pad slapper mates, I've got a couple of them, funny story I took this round to a friend's house and we got into it, I was hyping it up and saying you know this is the brand new one's going to be totally epic. 
two minutes into the game I just stop and take the disc out and take the pad off him and he's like what's going on the noise that was coming from their half of the room it was like being on the set of Saving Private Ryan Mortal Kombat is what I call a tap tapper you are tapping the directional buttons prior to slapping a button so it's a little bit different to Street Fighter you have quite a complicated input and then maybe one button on the face with this it's tap up tap down tap tap back and normally a face button input and then you can clasp one of the shoulder buttons and give that move an enhanced impact and look that's so cool Robocop fires like five bullets instead of the normal two everything's like ramped up I love it it can even break some moves so it's really cool it's like a turbo option to go to when you're pushing out punishment <laughs> you tried to reprogram me. I would have made you kill a diller. Incorrect. Whose voice was that? Why didn't they get Arnie in to record his own lines? That was a bit annoying. And of course they missed out two of my favourite from XL. I can't believe they did this. Found this hilarious commentator. Check this clip out. Oh, it's going down. I'm scared. Fight. The aliens, the xenomorphs starting off strong, gonna get the egg sack in place. We got A, B, fucking P. I actually do watch a lot of Evo and a lot of the eSport competitive side of this because the commentators are so funny and they get so hype. We've had nothing yet that really equals that just in one parry and that could be consequence of the structure of that game with its parry system but that was kind of maybe the industry's high point it certainly wasn't captain kangaroo It still gives me goosebumps. 2004, that was one hell of a thing to happen. And look up and look into it. Justin does his own YouTube stuff as well. He's just reviewed some of that new Street Fighter material that we've been seeing, which actually looks a shit ton better than Street Fighter V. I want to hang on this shot for a little while because this is amazing how well they have paid a tribute to that film with these winning screens. All of them get them and they're detailed AF. It's such a great piece of DLC to put in. That's why I didn't mind paying for it because it's not just a few new moves and a cool new character. All of the brutalities, all of those end screens, even unlocking some of their cosmetic stuff is totally epic to do on the one player in the arcade mode. <laughs> This Mortal Kombat also retails at the PlayStation 4 cost and gives you a free optional PlayStation 5 upgrade. And there was that sweet spot that we had last year. Borderlands did it, Forbidden West did it by accident, but this one's pretty, really worth the value. It's 4K straight, 60 frames per second. It's kind of jaw dropping. Fucking love stuff! One thing to make a note of is this no five boost on this game, which I was really shocked by because the patch was 62 goddamn gigabyte, and I thought the least you can do is put a 10th generation system update in it, but no. However, the game was always spectacular looking. You also might be thinking this is damn high for a 2017 EA game of all things and it is quite but on revisit and what they've done and added and some of the modes that you can explore with two people on an offline mode on the couch is pretty amazing. Now there is a, another catch with this game is I'm currently having that PSN issue where I'm waiting to renew my UAE PSN account so I don't actually have the paid access it's withheld so much content from me not on the split screen level loads of what looks like co-op online really cool campaign missions that i don't have access to so that means this is a true offline review of star wars battlefield 2. Think this is funny? now let's talk modes because on the surface this is a very boring split screener what it says to you is you can access the arcade or create like your own scenario what happens in the arcade is that you get to unlock these tiered missions that have a star system. You have to complete one to get to the next. It's kind of a cool incentive to look at what levels are offered to you. But it's always this boring co-op team gameplay, which is okay, but the novelty wears off damn quick. Okay. 
Some depth gets delivered in the form of being able to switch out your class and you have that card system which has gone under such review and is barely even the same system that it started as but essentially they're perk cards that you can put in, you have slots of three on three and that can change up some of your special moves. They have tried to explore that sort of loadout philosophy but the game's mechanics are so shallow that none of it really has a massive impact. Visually it's amazing, being able to play as Kylo and come out as some of the more recent films characters is definitely a cool thing but this standard co-op team gameplay is not going to change any lives now the next tier for me with interest is the onslaught mode which is still co-op but you've got a mercenary counter going down and you've got to kill stuff and this is where the perks really come into play because you need x-ray vision sometimes a guy might have a turret they can throw down we communicated a lot more it was a hell of a lot more intense and definitely the way forward on co-op mode Just briefly on options and screen splits, there are no performance toggles, that broke my heart. I thought there might be like a fidelity or performance mode switch on and there is a locked horizontal split. It's not too bad because it's a first person intense shooter but it works okay. Now we're still on co-op and some of this has been added with the recent updates and patches. I'm talking about new ships and some of the new moves that come with them and some new maps in the galactic starfighter mode which took me a while of fine they've managed to embed it behind a load of pointless options but this is where we had really quite an exhilarating experience the game doesn't hold back with what it's attempting which is a full 360 degree playing field and you are dog fighting using specials using boosts avoiding obstacles which are burning spacecraft that equal insta kill just getting your head around the controls of the damn ships is a job enough let alone trying to find someone to hunt down and kill but when the penny drops in you do get used to everything it's, it's amazing <laughs> nostalgic noises everywhere, voice samples from a lot of the actors in the films. This was a whole step up from some of that shallow co-op gameplay, which if you don't dig around, you'll end up just having the same fight on Tatooine with the same characters every time. You have to use your noggin and start moving those variables and changing everything up. You do have maps to choose from in the Starfighter modes. It's quite strange because all it really does is change the shape of the debris that's existing above said planet. So it doesn't really matter what you're choosing on that front. It's just the backdrop. It's a bit misleading. Bless them. Maybe they just wanted to put a few more map options in there. You're never going to be like, oh no, we've got X map because this debris is as random as it, as it looks. <laughs> Having said that, there is one outstanding level where you are circumnavigating a giant battle cruiser. One of you can take the role of keeping close to the ship itself, the other one can pick off the rebels as they're coming in on their ships. The communications called the samples are amazing. Kylo Ren's ship can go full stealth. This is potentially the sweet spot for the co op modes within the entire game. It's a very very cool set of variables that all come together like some sort of alignment and you end up having a really good time slaughtering the rebel scum and trying to get your head around how these ships control and they do have personalities i was impressed and surprised at that that choosing bombers and fighters straight up have loads of differences in their specials and their flight systems Okay, I get the chance to talk about my favourite mode, and obviously it is the versus mode, with all of the aforementioned pumped in as game types. So normally you don't pay too much attention to it, but at the top we've got a counter, blue and red. This is the amount of troops out on pitch at any given time, and your job is to minimise that number on the other person's team. Now I hear a character, hold on a second, Darth Vader gets an RPG to the head here, survives it. The man's ridiculously OP, we'll get into that in a second. So you're whittling down this number. You can either avoid the other player because you know they're not going to be easy to kill and you might as well just get on with killing all the pawns and then there'll be a bit of a showdown at the end. But you'll have the advantage because in theory you would have killed more of their troops than yours. Killing troops gives you funds which you can spend on spawning in a hero character. And I went with Vader early doors which completely terrified the person I was playing with. Gave me a massive smile on my face because I'm walking around the map like some cloaked 
next demigod. I'm here to put you back on schedule. You might think that seems like a bit of a broken system. You've got to your hero character first. Well, my opponent is saving their points to bring out their hero character later on. It's a bit like using a massive special in a fighting game. It just depends when you do it and your funds don't have to be spent on the best hero character. You could fragment the spend and not blow it all on Vader. But trust me, it's totally worth it. So Vader did eventually get his comeuppance. He has way too many hit points though. I will say that the guy is completely overpowered. But I had spent my money and my opponent then gets their own back by bringing out Ray and completely leveling things up. Now have a look at the numbers. You can see that there's only 11 people left. Things got really tense. This system's got loads of variables on it because you can switch out up to about 15 to 16 maps and all of the heroes differ depending on light or dark side and they all have their own card system there's huge depth here for an offline couch co-op pvp game i was gobsmacked never actually saw it play through correctly because i hadn't taken the time to notice how all these systems work in the versus arena it also will push this 1v1 hero versus mode which is about exciting as it sounds you haven't got those other troops there's no number system and it's just like playing the worst 3d fighting game ever i actually lost this game because of my early vader purchase i just didn't have decent enough of troops to access at the end and it went down to the wire with me picking some mediocre priced stormtroopers to try and have an impact on the outcome but to no avail okay you guessed it the best part of this game is versus flying around one of them dreadnoughts going through all of the cool ships and trying to shoot the crap out of each other in a Star Wars canon universe is pretty awesome and using specials is important once you get your head around the controls and the sort of globe map area that all the enemies exist in it's amazing this is one of the best PvP experiences I've had in a Star Wars game and you can thank Split Screen Gaming League I'll put a link in the description for keeping the dream alive We are now looking at the outbreak mode. Now allow me to crack the proverbial knuckles and tell you why this is such an incredible piece of zombie mode. It isn't in any of the previous games and I'm not even gonna tell you if it's in Vanguard because that's the only time we're gonna mention the V word. Let's look back at Entombed for a second and remember that it was a game that kind of touched on procedural generation for the first time. Well, the zombie mode outbreak aspect of that, full-blown procedural as far as I'm concerned when it comes to map variety, layout of objectives, and re-rolls of what those objectives are. This is super important because what put me off of all the other zombie modes in the majority of those previous games is the goddamn routine of it all. The waves closing in, that zombie shout that we've been hearing for the last nine years non-stop, and just the lack of variety in game type. There's no difference in task or goal, and it just gets to you. But this is almost like a campaign that is never ever the same. You'll be okay. Let me talk about the overarching objective with the maps and how it works with the number system and the scaling of the enemies if you get to the end of each map. When you get to a new map, you're looking for the objective, but you're looking to also get a bit beefed up before you get to said objective, so you're kind of prepared. This map here is completely new to me. It's a bunch of ships that you had to get a rope over to the other side to order to get to other sections of important parts of that map, and it threw a complete spanner in the world for my normal woodland nice and easy got loads of places to go and hide wasn't the case with that one and it's added to the reroll system so every time they put new maps in like the zoo it was really awesome to see it injected in to your outbreak gameplay to one of many dark ether objects the map variety is also really important to me because they have different vehicles occupying different maps and sometimes different special infected or zombie layout we also came across a helicopter which I'm pretty sure has been in it for a while but just did not realize that shooting that bird down will pay off
And here's the thing, it's a truly random feeling AAA experience for me and there's nothing like it I've got on a couch co-op level. You're so autonomous, there's no tethering, you can get on with your own thing but you do need, and bear this in mind, a lot of the UI is quite difficult to read. You kind of need to go on a big 4K TV to make head and a tail of that map. That's my only major complaint with it. Notice that our user interface is back to normal on the left screen and I've stuck with the vertical split. I actually quite like that squared look. I feel widescreen TVs just seem to give you a bigger pixel count. It's just my preference. You may prefer that horizontal. It's more traditional. I like it on driving games, but with this, it kind of looks pretty cool having a huge swathe of the screen to yourself. The Outbreak mode has up to seven maps that can re-roll on it now, and they don't come in order, no maps are really harder than the others, it's just what tier you access that map on. So the map you're most familiar with couldn't appear until right at the end of your run, which would make it nightmare difficult, all the zombies are packing armor, you need to upgrade everything at the end of each map, pack a punch, give yourself revive, and just turn into a massive moving badass. On the original review of this video that I put out at launch, there was so many comments about it not performing, people getting kicked, it would freeze, none of the maps would load out. When Outbreak Mode was first spawned, it was only three maps, even then I was like, this is awesome still. But for 2022, and a game that, you know, isn't getting as much maintenance as the newer Call of Duties would get, it's still banging, it's still amazing. I've even joined some Facebook groups of people, there's like tens of thousands of Cold War zombie fans out there still. It's still going really strong and still looking great for a PlayStation 5 game. It goes full Death Stranding Troy Baker here and spawns in some absolute nightmare material. In reality, it actually combines the first person gameplay with the loot drop mechanics of action role playing games like Diablo. How funny is that? It, it's pre loot shooter. The word hadn't been around or invented, no one had coined it. You'd think that they would have put two and two together, you're shooting loads, the stuff on the ground. It did take a little while to sort of gather momentum. I don't know if it was Gearbox that dreamt up the loot shooter term, but it was certainly Borderlands 1 that kicked off that whole genre. What a game. The original was remastered and re-released about three years ago. That's what we're looking at here. And they did a 1080, gave us at least 60 frames per second. Hand on heart, I have not played this remastered version on the PlayStation 5, so that might come up in the channel next year. It's probably worth a visit and probably should have done it for this video. I got one I've been saving for you. But we've got some footage, horizontal split notice, but this is where it was born for me. It is a little bit of a blur back on my Xbox 360 to really place when my mates came around and we actually first sat down and saw those numbers diving out of people we were shooting at and all that amazing rare loot. And just the fact that we were in cahoots taking down these huge expansive maps, it felt very liberating first time round. Borderlands 1 at the time, 2014, was released into a very sterile shooter environment it was a complete breath of fresh air with its attitude. It was a very offensive game with a lot of stereotypes in. It lampooned the sort of seriousness of the shooter genre at the time. What I can remember with absolute crystal clarity is the day I got the handsome collection on my new PlayStation 4 and had memories of Borderlands 2 on the Xbox 360 being an okay game but having massive performance issues, struggling here and there. When we got this over on that current gen system at the time, it was a real mind blower, things were smooth, everything worked and they injected so much DLC. You've got to understand that Borderlands 2 ran its DLC for about three years. Huge packs, loads of installations and some of them were absolutely amazing. One of them was called the pre-sequel and it was based in space with low gravity, amazing vehicles and almost moonlight lunar bases that you had to take down. It was so excellent and they really haven't gone forward in any of these outlandish directions since. This was also where Tiny Tina's was born. It was a piece of DLC and they obviously got big numbers on it because of what's come to fruition with the Borderlands games that are available nowadays. They also never really pushed on this bugs and insects thing. I 
was fascinated by this. They metamorphosize in these pods and come out as a larger bug. In these like massive arenas fighting these alien doll-like strange creatures. The whole thing was off the hook. Can we bring some of this back, please? So this is a bit depressing. One of my first couch co-op videos I ever made featured the handsome collection and it featured a song by the vines that is on the game itself. Now at the time I wasn't monetized and I didn't really check back. Things got very busy on the channel over those next two years but looking at what this got on the numbers you can lift stuff out now and not have to go through the copyright but I didn't spot. That's about a grand. That's about 1500 quid. Very expensive choice but a damn good tune and a little story behind it which I might go into one day. Please don't go and look at that video and add to the depression that is probably the third biggest YouTube video I've ever made. There you go, it's your first YouTuber who's told you not to look at one of his videos. Are those numbers a reflection on Couch Co-op and Split Screen sort of becoming unpopular or people losing interest in the subject? I don't think so. A lot of my early YouTube success was there because no one had come up with the idea of putting local co-op lists together. I have a lot more competition now and of course I'm put on a bit of a back burner, I think, with the algorithm because I love the old copywritten content. What have you got us looking at now? Okay, this one is a big explanation. This is the Assault on Dragon's Keep DLC that we were talking about on Borderlands 2 The Handsome Collection as a standalone edition playing on a PlayStation 5. Oof. So the cool thing is it's a really crisp 1080 and a massively pegged 60 frames per second. A little bit of loading on the shop items but it's just a real joy to see it running on that machine again and I put a whole video out about it. It's worth a look because it's damn cheap and it may have even gone free on the PlayStation Network. And just as a reminder, it's by far the strongest piece of DLC the Hanson Collection had on it because they just took the whole Dungeons and Dragons geek angle sword and sorcery and brilliantly blended it. I don't know if they've gone a little bit too far with Wonderlands. This is so the sweet spot with that subject matter. Okay, talking of sweet spots and holy crap. If you've never seen this game running on a PlayStation 5 before, on performance mode, in split screen, horizontal, those are things all need to be in place. It is a true blaster of the mind and one of the flagship PlayStation 5 titles that I own, both single player and local co-op. But this local co-op fighting and the chaos, the powers, the dissipation mechanics, the blood, the gore, the explosions, the elements, I could go on for about 10 minutes. It's an eye bleeder. Me and my mates are always like, after we do a level, we're like, whoa. You know, we kind of look at each other and just think, we're in the freaking future. Here's another depressing fact. I am by far the oldest gamer that I know by a square goddamn mile. Despite its obvious social disadvantages, it does have its couch co-op and split screen advantages because I can see over the whole landscape of time going back to 2001, how this genre has changed upgraded, even devolved, i.e. gone back a few paces, but with all the COD shenanigans. But I think it's a unique place to be in, and I don't see a lot of content creators who are as long in the tooth as myself, who have this much experience with local co-op and split-screen gaming. And that's why I kind of are doing these lists, because I want to show you all how far back a lot of couch co-op games actually go, and that this format was around 10, 15 years ago. And in some cases, there was more content around and more to do. Dada! Why do I feel that Borderlands 3 is so important? Well, I look at it like this. We're living in an age where they're really good at screwing things up on a sequel level and really just wringing stuff too dry, not coming up with enough fresh ideas or moving the original ideas to such a ridiculous place that the whole damn thing's just not recognizable anymore. What they did with 3 was turn the volume up incredibly and that's all we really needed. And that's where you see some of the best sequels in gaming is where they look at the pillars and the strong aspects and refine them and push them all in the correct direction. I don't think Borderlands 4 is gonna look anything like this. I think it's gonna go Nerf gun, bow and arrow, skelly bones like we see in Wonderlands with the odd blaspheme here and there. 
I would love to see the numbers and the data of who accesses split screen modes in a AAA game like this because Randy's probably sitting in his misogyny hut trying to work out whether they put it into the next one whether it's worth the time to put on the devs to make sure that this mode is you know pushed out with the campaign not just a tack on piece of crap which puts me over to the hugely lackluster DLC announcements and all that's been coming up for Borderlands 3. Gearbox need to get back to what they did with that and come up with some crazy outlandish off the wall environments and enemies that really just make you want to fire that game up again and with all of these powerful machines and really cool engines they could go to town with a great idea and location I want to see more from Gearbox on the innovation front with this game format because we're coming up to a decade and not too much has been pushed in to make it more desirable. I do want to say a special well done to Gearbox though for flying the flag for so many years and really keeping channels like mine afloat because there's loads of interest in this subject matter and having a AAA split screen looter shooter come out in 2022 was absolutely awesome so well done guys not you Randy. I've also broken a promise with the length of the video. I did say 20 minute format for the top five, but I clearly cannot pedal this video out any longer without repeating or going over this game way too much. It's a big one for the channel. Loads of videos have been spent on it. And help me out, I've got three games left. Two of them I've decided on, but I'm all in a tiz about the third slot. It beggars belief that the game we're gonna talk about came out in 2013, my God, and I probably can safely say we haven't seen a decent platformer on this level released since then. That's a depressing note, especially on the couch co-op level. Let's look at the original. This is Rayman 1. This came out on the PlayStation 1 and it's 1995. Now feast your eyes on some of the design of these levels and the platforms and the little mushrooms, the leaves, everything had to be kind of hand drawn on a paint system. So it was a beautiful thing to look at both then and now. <laughs> It also didn't sound too bad. It was one of the higher level platforming games that was available on the major systems that really had to lean on its heavy production, good looks and good sound and top end platforming action. That year of release saw some unbelievably strong Nintendo titles including Super Mario 2 and Donkey Kong. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the design of Rayman himself. This is French animation studio influence. So they went over to Montreal, Ubisoft sort of got rid of that team, but at the start, I was going through sort of mascot fatigue with a lot of video game characters. There was just hundreds of them. They were getting spat out all the time. Some stayed, some went. I didn't think that Rayman would have the mainstay in the industry that he did. This is the sequel and it coincides with everything going 3D at the time. But back to the design of the actual sprite itself, the floating limbs, I think he may have been a victim of the tech limits at the time and it have just been a lot easier to animate with him not having attached limbs, but that went further towards the iconic silhouette of the character itself. Just whilst we're on the subject of Iconic, I've put together a top local platformers list of 2021. There's some great games on there. Link in description, annotations. <laughs> that brings us nicely up to Rayman Legends the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 version. We're looking at the 5 version. Don't want to throw you in at the deep end here, guys, but this clip has got it all. Death, tragedy, betrayal, and rescue, all of which happened in about 16 seconds. The music amps up, the animations are flawless, puzzles, everything, local cult gameplay is completely top notch. This is one of the few games that may look better on the Vita. Having this as a portable platform is just bliss. <laughs> After playing Cuphead for a couple of years, you realize that a lot of those ideas are not completely original. And when you start morphing in size, going through levels on this that are almost borrower-like with vegetables, large pieces of furniture, or even food being everywhere, desserts, the themes on each of these worlds is incredible. And I'm gonna say it, 
we don't see games designed or looking this pretty anymore, especially on a local co-op platform level. It is so relentless with its clever ideas that you almost glaze over after a while and just have this permanent smile on your face. It had a bit of difficulty with its development and porting. This game was pushed out on the Wii U with a lot of integral structure being around that touch screen or that dual screen setup. So they did a really good job of putting it on current gen systems. We don't see any PlayStation 5 improvements unfortunately. As I say, the best place to look at this is on the Vita. Why is it so enjoyable after near on 10 years? Well, it just doesn't stop with its colorful injection of different gameplay modes and responsibilities and puzzles. We constantly switching up roles and communicating with each other about who's got to move what block where, it keeps the energy up and it loves to switch the game mode. Like near Automata, you find yourself on the back of a giant mosquito in a 2D scrolling shoot 'em up section and it's a complete joy. It also has a wealth of mini games and local co-op content that aren't pushed towards this platforming system. There's even like rhythm based music sections, but there's a football game in it that's got hours and hours of content and an online leaderboard system which is just still going and still really awesome. <laughs> If you're both quite into platforming then you get this L2 held down speed running psychology going where you're both just hurtling towards the end of the level regardless what the other players do and if they die they have to catch up and get whacked in their balloon state but what I'm talking about is the throttle is never off and you're always laughing smiling asking questions trying to work out puzzles that sometimes you don't even know how you managed <laughs> And don't even get me started on its collectibles, getting those purple things at the start or getting all the secrets in each level and it's blatantly telling you how many you've missed and all the characters that you can unlock that have different attack patterns and jump systems. There's so much to work with when you finish the game or if you want to get 100% completion. <laughs> This level always stunned me with its like Pandorum like floating structures around and the background and foreground parallax scrolling, the way it switches out, looking for the different secrets, the water, how the wind works with you and your couch co-op buddy, there's really nothing on the market that can give you this level of exhilaration. Ubisoft, you need to re-employ that team, open up the Montreal office and get more Rayman content out ASAP. <laughs> The legacy has continued a little bit with Mario vs. Rabbids, but it's not Rayman Legends. Fire nice. Now stay dead. I am featuring a couple of Couch Co-op YouTubers in the form of Julie and Lyle, and they have really delved into the original Divinity 1. It's an incredible game, quite large. It was very clear from playing that the studio were taking the subject matter very seriously. What level is he? Nine and the game format and when i say format i'm referring to an impeccable split screen setup absolutely jaw dropping when you first fired this up back on a playstation 4 in 2015 can you believe it's not cool Time of your death is sorry nick so here's the stunning divinity original sin 2 running on the playstation 5 in two player mode. And what I love about the system on this game is if you stick together enough, the screen doesn't split and you kind of get that feeling that you are in a singular game. But the selling point for the entire series and for me on this as a couch co-op video game is that the autonomy is absolutely through the roof. You are not hemmed in remotely with what the other player is doing or needs to get done. Many fragments swirl on my shore. See what I gather. That system in a turn-based action ARPG like Divinity Original Sin goes an extremely long way because some of the combat in other third-person ARPGs can be laborious or annoying or even going through various processes. You never really have the game pulled away from you as player two. You are very much independent and that is just a slick system because it also dovetails into the development of your characters in the party, i.e. if you go and play one player, you still get the XP that your couch co-op friend produced 
when they were playing with you as that party member. And it's also drop in, drop out, which I hadn't tested before. So uploaded my single player save and then started playing. Second player turns the pad on, hits options, bang, they drop in and take over as many party members as I allocate. Very cool stuff. Mind your manners round Griff, eh? That also goes for dropping out. So the convenience is excellent. With games like this, you need to play them in like two or three hour stints. So someone may have to come and go within the time that you're sitting there. It may not sound like a huge selling point, but when you're playing a video game and you've got to quit and restart to add somebody, it can sometimes just outweigh the <laughs> enthusiasm for getting them to join in the first place. It's also doing very well on performance and is boasting some blatant PlayStation 5 boosts. I don't know the numbers it's one of these games that doesn't sit on the ssd or hasn't had a playstation 5 official update pass through but it's slick and very high resolution and extremely smooth on frame rates the game doesn't worry too much about being massively busy as a turn-based game you don't see huge graphical fidelity taking place on screen but there's certainly a lot going on in the background with stats and numbers and sometimes on the base level playstation 4 machine especially with the sequel it would chug a little bit when turns were switching out that sort of stuff absolutely smooth and beautiful experience on the five Sword and Sorcery isn't for everybody, and I'm also not the biggest fan of turn-based fantasy games. I much prefer turn-based like future machine gun gene stealer games, if you get my drift. But the Divinity series just won me over. With its split-screen implementation, I straight away needed to have a look at it. But once you get sucked into the story and really start investing in some of the characters that you've chosen to put on your team, which, let me tell you this, changes on every replay because you'll know where other hidden NPCs are or really cool people to have on your party exist on playthrough so you just start mixing it up. It's never the same with your party loadout if you want it to be. So the immersive and detailed story in the investment with the team that I'd built and the continuation of the events from Divinity 1 having that brilliant start on the ship just sucks you in. There's no ignoring it. Once you play a little bit you're like oh my god there's so much Fun to be had behind all of these wicked stats, spells, elements, monsters, team build and magicians is absolutely crazy good. Teleporting, crocodiles, how are you supposed to deal with that? What sort of game says, we'll put crocodiles in, right, which can basically insta-kill you and then they're like, oh, we need something else. Yeah, let's make them teleport. Why not? Totally in canon with the species. Wanted to include some cool footage of the autonomy. We are in completely different sections of this map. I am getting on with a completely different subquest, and I have said that before. Few games offer that side-by-side -side feeling of autonomy. It's like you've got two copies on one screen. Try doing something like that on Gears of War or Tiny Teenies. You'll get ripped into a cutscene at the other players instigated the immersion, pulling away is everywhere. This is really dig your heels in and have a proper gaming session on a superbly deep action ARPG, brackets turn-based. They were so mesmerized by Apon's storytelling that they spent the whole night transfixed. You know I couldn't help myself do it. I snuck it in, didn't I? Snuck it in right at the end. You know I was talking about that niche audience thing and turn-based stuff turning some people off. Jordan and Water is Divinity Original Sin in goddamn real time. Not got the same amount of party size, but this is a white knuckle ride through a superbly written and imagined nightmare sword and sorcery world, roguelike elements, a campaign-like structure, amazing 16-bit animations and colors, pixel art. The vibe is through the roof with Children of Moira. <laughs> It's hockey system still blows the mind, and the fact that the studio are really quiet about sequeling anything from this side, bit annoying, I want more content. That free DLC was absolutely amazing, link in description, and this stands head and shoulders above just about every other action-based couch corp ARPG on the market. I shit you not, go and look at it. It's really one of the last games I'll be talking about on the top 25 list. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
What are we going to be looking at on a couch co-op level for 2023? Well, there are some really cool indie Game Pass and some PlayStation exclusive couch co-op games that have come out right at the back end of December and in January. So I'll scrape them together, put another list out pretty soon, and I'm deep in my Monster Hunter Rise obsession. You'll be seeing the PlayStation 5 online review of that coming out shortly. It's so damned impressive. It's my previous video. Please, please have a good butchers. Links to Judy and Lyle in description, and I'll leave you with a classic mantra and an achievement that popped up to my complete surprise. I have been Couch Q. I will see you down there.